Hi, everyone. It's with great honor today that I welcome Lyle McDonald to the channel. How are you doing today, Lyle? I'm very well. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Hi, Toby. You haven't done any podcasts for a while. Um, have you been working on other projects behind the scenes? No, I mean, I'm always kind of working on something. I just kind of checked out for a little while. I got burnt and frustrated, which happens every, I mean, I've been doing this for good grief, 30 years now. And yeah, every so often I just kind of get a little bit burnt out and frustrated. And I just kind of checked out of the fitness industry, which when you've been in it long enough, it can be a, a bit of a mess sometimes, if you just put it that way. So, but I decided, you know, it's New Year, it's probably time to get back on the horse and get involved again for whatever reason. Yeah, I can imagine the burnout is real. I've been following your work since the old Miss Waits news oh, wow. back in the day. Yeah. I remember heading to work after hours because it was the only place that had a, a reliable internet connection with a printer. I used to print wow. out yeah. all your keto experiment diaries so that I could reread yep. and read them and have them on file there. Now I use the body recomposition forum as the only place where I go to get my information. So one thing I've really probably, noticed about, a lot of your listeners probably have no idea what we're talking about. So this would have been <laughs> 93, 94. Like this is when the internet started and I was there. Yes. Um, I'd gotten on a, a four hour AOL disk coming out of college. And like, that was, that was pretty baller, like a CD-ROM. And then, you know, when we had to set up modems for the internet and there was Usenet, which is that early messaging board. And so Miss Fitness Weights was really one of the, the early things I remember. I mean, this was pre-email listservs. Can you stop? This was pre-forums. That wouldn't be till like the late 1990s, early 2000s. I mean, there's still, there's people in my my Facebook group that are still, I mean, you you obviously that I've known from, you know, 95 that are still floating around on the internet. So yeah, that's that's where it all started for me way back. Well, in the, you know, the AOL chat rooms. So yeah, it's something that's quite unique to you as well, because a lot of the industry figures and the big names, they don't really engage or participate in forums with their content. Yeah. They put it out and then they leave it to the audience. Why Why have you been such a consistent participant to forums over the years? For whatever reason, since the very early days for me, I've always just like liked interacting with people. Probably some of it I just like hearing myself talk. Um, but I mean, I've, you know, MFW days, I had a forum that ran for, oh my God, so many years, the old Monkey Island forum. And I had a support forum for my books. And I don't know. That's just like, it's, well, part of it, I have a very strange psychology and I always have that. Um, I don't like doing work by which I mean things that I get paid for, right? Like, like back in the day, right back when, when websites were starting and I would have like two articles do one was for like cyber pump. It was free. And then one I was getting paid for most more. I would always do the free one because that didn't feel like work to me. Whereas something that I'm getting paid for. I mean, honestly, I feel like I'm obligated to care. I mean, I care no matter what, but you can, you know what I mean by that. So I think just like, I, I've told people, cause like you go on my forums or my Facebook group or something and somebody will ask me a question and I'll write extemporaneously these, you know, huge posts. Would I ever sit down and write that for a book project? No, because the book is work and this is not. So I think that's part of it. And I just like, you know, I, I unlike, many, and this will sound, I, I don't mean it exactly the way this sounds, like a lot of people that get into any industry, in the fitness industry, it's for business. I made a career out of what I loved, what I was trying to use to make myself a better athlete. I mean, that was it. I just wanted to be better than mediocre. Um, but I actually had this crazy thing where I actually like helping people. I know it's, I know it's crazy. So I just, you know, that's just been kind of my thing. I enjoy and I think some of it is just my reaction or my dislike of the fitness industry. And this is part of why I got burnt out. Like, I get it. You have to make a living. It's very difficult, et cetera. But when I see people frequently knowingly giving bad information, it really aggravates me. It's like their egos are so big. Their need to do that is so massive that they don't care that they are misleading people and wasting their relatively short training lives with nonsense. And it really aggravates the hell out of me. I also had this very, this personality, not quirk, but 
when people ask for help, and I mean who actually genuinely wants help, like, because I have this this reputation, ah, oh, Lyle hates everybody and he thinks everybody sucks. No, just most people. Like, I just don't, like, I just don't deal well with most people. And, and even in my, my personal life, I have, like, friends that I would take a bullet for and don't care, like, I don't have acquaintances. And it's the same thing. If people legitimately want help, if they legitimately want to, whatever, information about their diet or training or whatever, like, I'll give them 100%. That's just who I am. And if they don't want what I'm selling or don't want to listen to what I have to say, cool. I'm not their dad. I'm not their coach. So I think that's it. I just, I like, generally like, and I like hearing myself talk um, or hearing myself type, however you want to look at it. So I do enjoy, I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy I mean, No, it's fine. I've been loving your recent YouTube videos, particularly that bro scientist one, because oh. it, like you said, it seems that we're in the era of peak charlatan. And unfortunately, the reality is that some of these biggest scumbags in the industry also have the largest following. So the amount of misinformation and the constant yeah. grip with the muddying of waters, the yep. shoddy research, the endless contradiction. Yep. It's so good that there's someone with integrity that's on the sidelines independently calling out these people for their bullshit. So of this rogues gallery, who is the worst of the worst offenders in your in your opinion? Oh. God. I, I don't even think you can and I, and I really don't like I don't want to just like I, I complain enough about this industry I don't want to turn this into like a name calling thing the industry as a whole and, and make no mistake it's always been like this right you go back to the earliest days of strength and health and fitness magazines in the early 20th century and I mean my god weeder with muscle and fitness and flex it's always been like this to one degree or another where people just selling goofball information uh supplements has always been a big part of it because that's where the money is so you know when i was coming up late 80s when i really got into this all you do is the magazines and they were full of bs by and large right all the articles in flex it was like the pro bicep workout none of the pros that's not what they did they were all ghost written and it was used to sell product because especially then nobody talked about steroid use nobody and then the internet started and suddenly these websites were a thing. And again, it, it, I don't know who your demographic is, but you know, any younger listeners have to realize nobody knew what this was for in the 90s. The internet was just this thing. Um, I don't know if you know Millard Baker. He ran one of the early websites I wrote for mesomorphsis.com. Yeah, and like 97, 98, he went to the Arnold Classic and he was walking around handing out flyers going, hey, come check out my website. And there were little people like, what's a website like like it's so hard for people that grew up with it to understand the change so that started and websites started and articles started um you know early t nation and stuff and, and it was still you know once a day once a week t nation then realized that the, every time they ran an article they got more traffic and they sold more product so then it was once a day every day twice a day seven or i don't even know how many articles they put up now and the thing is that there's just not that much to say. Every article contradicts every other article. I know I told a story in my group recently. It was a uh, T Nation, Testosterone Nation, started as a print magazine. It was right there on the TC Luoma had left muscle media that was Bill Phillips, and there was just this brief, and it was actually polybagged with one of the, uh, <laughs> an American adult magazine's penthouse. So I picked up the first issue, and in one article, it said that. You should eat six meals a day because sumo wrestlers only ate once a day and they got fat. And in the same issue, there was an article by um, Ori Hoffmeckler, the warrior diet guy, that said, no, eating six meals a day will make you fat. Only eat once a day. Same issue. How in the world can anybody possibly swim through all this and figure? So that was then. Then, you know, you got bodybuilding.com, how many thousands of articles, half of which contradict one another. And then we got into forums and then social media. And now with Instagram and TikTok, every seven seconds, someone is saying, do this, don't do that. You must do that. You can't do this. And on top of which, when you have to generate near daily content or multiple times daily, I mean, I don't, I don't know how they do it. Like I can barely update my Instagram a couple times a week because I ran out of dad jokes and pictures of my dogs. How people put up like four posts a day is beyond me. Same thing with YouTube. There was a guy on there one time who's a hair loss guy. It's like, yeah, I do two videos a day. Oh my God, how? Like, I don't, I don't understand. So, 
and, and then you then again, you've also got in in the training world, a the genetic issue, but the drug issue that has always colored this. You got people that build their physiques with nothing but drugs. And since they're big, they're assumed to know what they're talking about. And their training is not always, I mean, there's some good information, but most of it's garbage because drugs cover up the mistakes. And then, but that's, it, and the naturals do it and they don't, but they don't care. They don't care that they're missile. I mean, you'll find exceptions. There's a guy, I want to say, is it Jordan Peter, the UK bodybuilder. Not Jordan Peter. Don't, don't confuse those two. Um, hey. Something like that. And like, he's very honest about his own use and has done videos about, you know, look, this is the difference between natural and drug field training. But people don't want to talk about that. Or they call them special sports supplements for those who know what I'm talking about. And pretend that it's the drugs, dr the, it's the training and nutrition driving the bus. And so I don't know if you can really identify uh, a worst. I think the problem I have now, and this is that video I did, you know, about the, because, because I watched this, did this video for any of the listeners that want to go look it up. I was the, really the first one online in MFW days. And if you were there, you remember who's really trying to be like, look, this is what the science says, arguing against, you know, the bro science, as we call it now, which was the decades of anecdotal ideas. Which again, as I've gotten older and a little bit more mature, I look back and go, you know, I was your typical fresh out of school academic, which meant I had a little bit of an overinflated belief in what I knew. And I've thankfully gotten a little bit better as I got older. But like, so you look back at that stuff and go, okay, you ignore the drug era, ignore the 70s and that you look before that. They can't have been doing everything wrong, right? They can't. They wouldn't have made any, like it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of, pro, you know, they, they figured things out. And it's, it was kind of to, to, to have looked back at that and gone, bro, scientists, you know, we have academics is kind of a white ivory tower bullshit. Like I said, I did it. I look back and go, maybe we should. But, and, you know, but I still believe in controlled science. I still believe in that. And in some cases, the science absolutely supports what they were doing. And other times it said it's absolute nonsense. So one of the. Sorry, I was going to say one of those guys was very science-based and iconoclastic and ahead of his time, and his thinking was uh, Dan Duchesne. And oh, I know God. that yeah, your collaboration with him was quite influential in your nascent development as a researcher. Oh, very much, so. very much so. He, um, you know, Duchesne was, you know, he he was in the trenches in the '80s, figuring this stuff out, and he was brilliant. He was truly a, a creative genius. Um, he, his death was such a loss to this industry, but he. He did start getting into the research, I think, earlier than most. And Muscle Media 2000 was really the first print magazine that really tried to use science on any level to, 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 the, to, to bring to training and nutrition and supplements and stuff like that for good or for bad. And so Duchesne was absolutely there when he got out of jail the third time, which was after I'd been on MFW for a while. But I was really one of the, the first people, if not the first, like really pushing science or trying to. And at that point, nobody wanted to listen. And then in the 2000s, more of the people, names I think folks listening to your podcast would know now, like Eric Helms, Brad Schoenfeld, uh, James Krieger, Lane Norton, some of those people were starting to come up. And I know that's when, because they told me that they grew up, you know, they came up reading my stuff and that most of them had read my. And so I saw relatively more science. I mean, realized evidence-based fitness was never more than an edge, even now. I got into a, uh, we'll call it a heated discussion with someone at, at there's an ISSN conference in Austin one year, and I went and met some of the, the you know, the names like Alan Aragon, some of those guys were there. And, you know, they were, they're all the science nerds. And one of them was trying to tell me, yeah, I, I really think evidence-based fitness is, is really increasing. I go, no, it's not. I go, you're seeing a highly curated group of people that are explicitly looking for you. And I can guarantee you that if you took the visits to every single one of our websites and added them together, bodybuilding.com gets more than that in a day. And T-Nation gets more than that in a day. Even, you know, so yeah, it had gone from 5% of trainees to 10%, but it was still, and it always will be. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. But it's funny when I talk to people or, or, you know, or do, I'll do consultations and things of that nature. And they're always like, yeah, you know, feel really dumb. Like, you know, I read all the, 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 the early dumb bodybuilding stuff. I'm like, 
I did too. I mean, you can't know what you can't know. And if you're the average person or the average 15, 16, 17 year old, or even the average college student, you decide you want to get into this silly little hobby, you're far more likely to come across. I mean, again, for our websites, I don't, I mean, is bodybuilding.com still big? I don't know. In the era of social media, I mean, I doubt people coming in now, they're not going to websites. They're going to Instagram. They're going to TikTok. They're going to find the biggest, buffest guy and they're going to follow him. And that's who, where they're going to get the information from. And they're going to probably waste several years and then maybe go looking for other stuff. Um, and maybe they find me or they find you or they find one of the other people. And um, so it's still a minority. But even with that, and I know I tend to jump around conversationally. So I'm like, you know, I look back at my books of which I've written, was it 14 now? Some ungodly number. Um, I've, I've had a long career, I'm very old. And um, my books are on the technical end of things. And I don't bullshit people. And I will, I mean, it, 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 again, it's so funny when I used to crap on new supplements and this and that and the other. And we'd be like, oh, you're just, you're just bitter and you just want it to not be true. I'm like, no, you're wrong. I was an athlete for years. I wanted it all to be true. I still want it to be true. I want there to be magic. I do. I never didn't want there to be magic. I wanted something to make me more than mediocre as an endurance athlete in the weight room. And then I started reading the actual research on it. And it's, there's not. There's not quick, easy, permanent fat loss. There's not a quick, easy, permanent way to get to your, your strength or muscle gain results other than just, you know, 600 milligrams, as we like to joke about. Like, I do. But I don't write books that way because I can't. And I knew early on. I was never going to appeal to the mass market of dieters. A, because I'm not going to tell them what they want to hear. And B, how can me as a person possibly compete with, you know, these gigantic book publishers who are going to publish the same nonsense every year, every month, every week of magic, easy weight loss, whatever dumbass thing is popular now. I've watched it all. I used to read endless old diet books. It's funny. There's nothing new. I found there was the wild weekend diet where you ate really strict during the week and then got to cheat on the weekends. And I'm like, okay, this is the two day diet, which is like the five, like there's nothing new it just comes in and out of style. But the, my point being that I was interested in the people who were ready to listen to what I had to say, the people who had always done it. I mean, we've gone through, the quick, easy fat loss diet stuff that never worked. And then somehow they came to me and were like, well, I may not like what this guy has to say because it's not what I want to hear, but being told what I wanted to hear didn't work. Yeah. My way is you've always, kept, you've always kept your integrity with that because you've never been the master of hype or advertising or hyperbole. I'd make but, a lot um, more money if I if I was, but yeah, I can't do exactly, it. Exactly, but it's short term. Whereas, like you know, you sure. look, your career's been going for over thirty years, and you're right. even just building a bigger following. It, exactly. Just switch tracks a little bit, Lyle. You let, let me like actually say, saying... let me quickly finish that thought. That was just background. Oh, to sure. go. Same thing in training. I think the people that you know they do the goofy bullshit or the drug driven, and it doesn't work. And then they finally start looking for better information. And I'm not saying they automatically end up in my group or whatever, but they're like, okay, I've been told the lies. Now let's go actually see what's going on. And maybe it's science-based, maybe it's a good natural, but yeah, it's just, there's, it's an industry filled with endless bullshit and it always will be. And it does frustrate me because people are like, ah, he just hates everything in this. And he just like, no, you don't get it. I'm so angry about this because I do love it so much. And I want everyone to get good advice and reach their goals. I'm angry because I get pissed off that people are lying to people. So. And that's the thing. You also give away so much information for free. So they can't sort of say that you're capitalizing on their attention or anything like that. But like you said, you wrote 14 books. And one of those books that gained a lot of popularity was the book on keto dieting written over 25 years ago. Yeah. There is this huge argument or debate going on in the zero carb community, carnivore community, that you can gain muscle effectively on those kind of zero carb diets. But when I think about hypertrophy, I think, well, it's mechanical tension plus progressive overload and right. enough calories to be in a surplus. 
But why is it so difficult to build muscle on a zero carb diet without the presence of carbs? It's, I think there's a couple reasons. There's been a couple studies looking at the level, the influence of muscle glycogen, carbohydrates stored in the muscle, on like expression of genes and muscle protein synthesis. And it's mixed. Like one study said it mattered and another study said it didn't. I think some of it is just flatly hormonal in as much as hormones play a role in all of this. Even at maintenance calories or above, pardon me, ketogenic diets are still sort of technically a catabolic state. If you look at insulin and SHBG and insulin uh, growth factor one and things of that nature, I mean, it's not impossible, but I certainly don't think it's optimal. And, and I think what little research has been done kind of kind of bears that out. Although the difficulty, the one study I'm thinking of off the top of my head, the problem was that the ketogenic diet caused people to eat too little, right? Their caloric intake was way lower. This is a problem, like, again, do I believe in science? Yes, the scientific method, I think, is the best that we have. Are the studies frequently very difficult to do and very, yes, because humans are very hard to control. Right, so my first mentor, never heard of him. He went to another school in Canada. He was a materials engineer. He studied rocks. Training was his hobby. And he, I met him online early days. And I mean, we corresponded daily for over a decade. And if nothing else, he really helped me with my critical thinking because as a PhD engineer, he didn't fool around. But he thought that most biological sciences were garbage in the sense that, like I said, he studied rocks. Rocks, like how much variance is there between two rocks? Like tens of a percent. Super, super exciting guy. Uh, God almighty to study. With humans, even under the best of conditions, you're looking at tenfold variability in anything. In I mean, just in any biological system you look at, couple that with the fact that it costs millions of dollars to do controlled nutritional research. And they'll be like, all right, we put you on this diet. We're going to give you recommendations, maybe let you self-report, which is terrible, and hope for the best. And then when they look at it, they're like, well, one group, the car group ended up eating more. The keto group ended up eating too little. Yeah, the keto group didn't gain as much, but the keto group lost fat. I'm like, well, that just says they were in a deficit. And of course, that's not going to be optimal for gaining muscle. So it's like, I mean, I, people have done it. I think you also have the issue of just like just eating enough, just getting enough calories in. Can you support enough, you know, depending on your training style, can you support the volumes that you may need to be doing about carbs? The answer is probably not. So I'm of the opinion that, I mean, it can probably work. I don't think it's optimal. I mean, if it were me, I would put at least some carbs around training to try to get a little bit better protein synthesis or whatever. But yeah, so I mean, <laughs> said I think it can can probably work. It wouldn't be my first recommendation, certainly. Yeah, that. some somebody mentioned it along the lines of it's like taking the stairs versus taking the elevator to the top of a tower. You, you could probably get there, but one way is a little bit more effective. Yeah, I mean, I would just ask, like, why? Like, why would you even, like, bother trying? Like, why, you know, why, why deliberately potentially hamstring yourself? Like, and make no mistake, it, for most, you know, for reasonable training volumes, and I'm sure we'll touch on that at some point, you know, the, the endless volume arguments, which are just frustratingly, whatever, is for most moderate training volumes, the amount of carbs you actually need is not shockingly high, right? And as and as I did the math in this first book, because I because when I looked at that and I'm like, I think what I came up with back of the envelope math, it was like every two heavy sets was like five grams of carbohydrate. Like it's really not that much. So if you're looking at that in terms of total carbohydrate intake in that sense, it's not enormous. But then again. You have to eat something. And this has been sort of one of my refrains over the years, right? Because to a great degree, whether you're talking about fat loss or muscle gain, to a degree, I'm mainly concerned about the caloric intake and the protein. Carbs and fats are to a degree negotiable, depending on training volumes, insulin sensitivity, how much body fat you're carrying, preferences, things of that nature. I mean, outside of the extremes, right? If I've got a high-level endurance athlete who's on the bike six hours, that's a very different conversation 
than the average person who's maybe doing, you know, 10 heavy sets in a workout or 50 or even 20 heavy sets. They just don't need that many carbs to support overall. But again, you have to, you can only eat so much protein, right? And I, I really, I don't know how some of like, especially the carnivore, like what do they eat to even get enough calories? Like you can't do it. And I guess just fatty meats. Um, there's no, there's a, there's a guy named Oliver Starr. You know that name? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, way back in the day. I don't think he's still around. I don't think he's around anymore. And he decided, <clears throat> this was in Peak Training Journal, a very short-lived magazine. And among all the other things it proved was that you cannot maintain a bodybuilding magazine without taking ads. But <clears throat> he decided to do this experiment where he was going to use injectable insulin on a low-carb diet. And he ate nothing but protein. He ate 600 grams of protein every day. So 2,400 calories of protein while using insulin. Thankfully, he, I mean, like he was going through a tub of protein powder per day. Because like that's the issue that comes up is how can you actually get enough calories in that way? And I mean, again, I guess it's just with fatty meat. But, you know, to your point, even at a gram to a gram and a half per pound of carbs, about two to three point three grams per kilo. Right. That's a very moderate amount of carbs. I would expect even that to give better growth than a pure keto diet. Just better hormones. Everything's going to be relatively more anabolic, maintain muscle glycogen. Like, it, I mean, it's it's interesting to me when you look back at the, you know, the old school guys, the bro, the bro lore. And for dieting, they would do about a gram per pound of carbs, so 2.2 grams per kilo, which I mean, for, you know, a, a 180, what's that, an 85 kilo person, you know, that's whatever. Uh, you know, 160 grams of carbs. It's not a lot, but it's enough. And then for gaining, they would do three grams per pound, about 6.6 .6 grams per kilo. And, you know, if you sit and math it out and add in the protein and fat, you're like, yeah, that's probably about right. I mean, again, they weren't, they, they can't have been wrong about everything. Um, they might not have been right about everything, but, you know, you math that stuff out. That's about, whenever I set up, you know, rational diets, it's about where it comes out, you know. But they were also doing, you know, 20 sets per muscle group, very high volumes of training. If you're looking at the average person, you know, three to four grams per kilo of carbs in that range is enough without being excessive. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, thank you for clearing that up. I'm just surprised all about the guy that only ate protein and took insulin. I sort of thought he'd end up in a I, I, Yeah, that was not, I think, the safest thing to have done. And it was interesting because he, he claimed to have gained like 10 pounds of lean body mass uh, by about four and a half kilos with no fat gain, but his strength didn't go up. So I'm thinking somehow some kind of weird glycogen storage or, or some, something weird was going on in that experiment. I'm just not seeing. I mean, it's more like how did he not kill himself with a hypoglycemic? But he was basically relying on the conversion of protein to carbs, which I would say, why bother? Why, why, you know, why not just eat a moderate amount of carbs and be done with it? But I mean, it was just one of those one time experiments, some craziness he wanted to do. I did yeah. my own experiment with the whole carnivore keto thing one time and trying to gain. It was the time where I used the largest amount of anabolics ever right. in a cycle and I didn't gain anything. Really? The strength up as well. But yeah. obviously, there's no, nothing there to bind the water in, probably from the steroid use. So. Yeah. Yeah. I was just amazed. I used Anadrol. I used testosterone. I used a couple of other things as well. And especially Anadrol because it gains so much water off the bat. Right. And I think that's, I mean, I think if you're just looking at it in a, from a overall hormonal perspective, you will simply be more relatively more whole body anabolic. I mean, everything will work better. There's actually, this is just, again, going back into the archives of my brain. There was a, an old article in Muscle Media 2000. I don't remember might have been by Mooney. There was a guy, he was actually... A, Michael he, Mooney. Yeah, I think it was by Michael Mooney. And yeah. what he, he sort of sketched out he, what we knew then, which realized in, you know, 90, in 89 was not much. Um, I said, so glad I went to university when I did, because in 88 to 93 when I was in school, we didn't know anything about anything. There were like six hormones. And that was it. Now, oh my God, I cannot imagine trying to figure out physiology now in the modern era 
But anyway, so he'd sketched out sort of the hormonal profile of puberty in terms of what was going on with testosterone and growth hormone IGF-1 and thyroid and all these other hormones. And, and I think, and sort of what he, he drew up, and I know Duchesne commented on this, was that you actually look at what steroid users are doing or drug users are doing, whether they know it or not. And the answer is, I mean, they don't. They don't know it explicitly. It's more, what they have essentially done is found a way to mimic what is a natural steroid cycle, which is male puberty. And if you kind of look at everything they've slotted in there, they've just recreated what's going on then because that's when you get optimal anabolic effects is when you are optimizing all of the different hormonal systems. And like, so for example, we know that when insulin is very low, as it will tend to be on a carnivore keto diet, sex hormone binding globulin goes up. So you have less free hormone available. You're not going to get the, you know, the, the conversion of GH to IGF-1 in the liver. Like you want the whole system to be anabolic. And I mean, again, that's why, even if it hasn't really been studied, there's a reason that polypharmacy works. There's a reason that, I mean, it, I mean, make no mistake, just taking more works to a point. Duchesne once talked about that. He, he wrote somewhere, he was like, we've tried it all. We've done, you know, pyramids and diamonds and descending pyramids and all these different shapes to try to do this and that and the other. And he goes, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is just taking more. Uh, and, and he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't, I mean, again, he, he'd done it all with everybody for decades. But I think if you look in the modern era, he did comment, he's like, once the athletes figured out how to optimally use GH and insulin, it did have an effect greater than just plugging in more, you know, more milligrams of testosterone. And then guys, you know, added what, IGF-1. And he talked about one time and he was like, you know, thyroid does impact protein synthesis. He's like crafty competitors throw in, you know, just a little 25, 50, just a little extra T3 just to kind of keep the system, you know, running on top. And then we've got all the, an excuse me, ancillaries and peptides and all that other stuff. So I think that it's just a matter of why wouldn't you hormonally optimize everything to get the best training, to get the best recovery, to keep warm. Yeah, and, and, and the mistake I see people make or the, and this is something I've, I've railed against for years, or rather the, the fallacy is they see it as one or the other. You go, you say, look, having carbs in the diet will probably help. And you go, well, why would I eat an 80% carbohydrate diet? I'm like, maybe you should stop doing keto so that you'll be literate. Let's look at what I actually said, not what you heard. I didn't say that the options are zero carbs and 80 percent what i am saying is that maybe two to three grams per kilo which is maybe 40 percent carbs or whatever the percentages work out to and they're like well, why would i want to eat 70 percent i'm like what i don't like i it i i see i i have these arguments or i used to have these arguments with people and i'm just like i don't I'm using very simple language here, and I don't understand why you can only see the world as one of the two extremes. It's actually a very funny book back when um, paleo really started. And uh, there's a guy, um, John Ivey, who I know. He's a, I, I knew him at the UT Austin. It was the paleo diet for athletes. And <laughs> the basic argument, such as it was, was that, well, since endurance athletes, typically eat way too many carbs and not enough protein, which is frequently the case. Well, they should just eat nothing but protein and vegetables and no carbs. Like, huh. This, this seems to me like a poor approach to it. Like, couldn't you just tell them to eat more protein and cut their carbs by 10% rather than going from 80-10-10 carbs, protein, fat, to 30% protein, 70% fat. It, it was just like I didn't, it seems to me that there's a happy middle ground. Which again, going back to what we talked about originally, this is the other reason that I'm not more popular than, than I am. I, I do this, I like to look at nuance. I tend to take a middle ground to things. I won't talk in extremes because it, one of the super, the funniest things with my keto book, because I wrote this book and it's very technical and it's very much, Here's what happens. If you're going to do this, here's what you need to know. 
the anti-keto people, the classical dietitians, were like, oh, this guy sucks because he loves keto diets and he thinks that's what everyone should do. I'm like, have you actually read the book? Because you, you'll never find that sentence. I never even say, here's why someone should do it. Nowhere in the book. And then the keto zealots don't like my book because I don't say it's magic. So actually taking the middle ground means that everybody hates it, except for people that can understand context and nuance. And so, anyway, so this, this paleo thing for, and then the truly the, the funnier, the hilarious thing, most hilarious thing about it was then, because they were like, oh, no processed foods, and what would paleo man eat? I'm like, was paleo man doing the Tour de France? I don't think so. This, this image of paleo man doing these things is stupid. Um, we did evolve as endurance runners. However, they also look at the Kenyan diets. They're doing all right. Anyway, is they were like, but you can still have carbo gels around training. And I kid you not, unless I dreamt this up, it said, because that would be like when Paleo Man found a beehive full of honey. You can't make it up, folks. The, 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 the justifications that these people will come up with, when then it was Paleo plus milk and Paleo plus carbs. Well, it's all Paleo until it's... I'm like, or maybe just eat some carbs and be happy. What's even even more with this book, if they'd written it for strength power athletes, I would have been perfectly okay with it. Because strength power athletes, power lifters, shot putters, Olympic lifters, things like that, they don't need that many carbs. Like they're the ones that realized years ago that the endurance athlete recommendations were terrible. You put them on 80% carbs, they feel like shit. You put, you know, they're the ones that, that were for years were like, no, we need more protein. We feel terrible on this diet. And again, if you're doing triples in the weight room or throwing a shot put for singles, how many carbs do you need, right? So, so anyway, so you see this, you see these, these extremes of, well, since I don't want to do the typical diet that's 80%, even the typical Western diet isn't, you have to do keto. It's one or the other. It's like, or well, maybe there's, you know, moderate carbs, moderate fat, moderate protein. Um, you know, I've said for years, oh. If one I of your books that ties, I was just going to say, one of your books that ties the variables very well together and it's been my go to playbook for the last 20 years is The Ultimate Diet 2.0. Mm. Whether it's for gaining or for fat loss, I found it works equally well if yeah. you follow the program. Right. It's been, around, it's been around for like 20 years, but yeah, have you made not. any changes or tweaks to the original recommendations? Because a lot of people were asking that question. Um, I think, I'm trying to think what I would change now. I would pro I might do a couple different things with training in terms of I don't know if I would have like so there are people that aren't aware of it it's it's a it was a revamp of the old the original ultimate diet which is Dan Duchesne and Michael Zumpano back in the day and just on that note if anybody's listening Zumpano originally wrote this article called the rebound diet that's what this started out I have been looking for a copy of this thing for 20 years to no avail the magazine that it was supposedly printed in, I've looked at the table of contents of every issue that was ever printed. The thing doesn't, I convinced the thing doesn't exist. I, try, I even reached out to Zumpano himself. Nobody, so if anybody out there has, happens to have seen it. Anyway, what it was is it was a 10-day cycle of integrated diet and training. And I won't describe the 10-day cycle because it's boring. I remade this into a seven-day cycle. And it was sort of a, it was a cyclical ketogenic diet, right? And this is where I kind of, 98, 96, when, when, the, when Duchesne came on, he released his book called Body Opus that reintroduced cyclical ketogenic diets. And by that, I mean you spent the week, Monday through Friday, on a very low carbohydrate diet. And on the weekends, you would carb load. At the same time, there's also De Pasquale's anabolic diet, which is very similar, um, that he supposedly developed to help uh, drug-tested bodybuilders clear the drug. That, that was what my professor told me. I don't know if that's true. But anyway, so he, he had his body opus diet. And that was like, I did that. That was kind of online, wrote about, you know, you mentioned the, the body opus diaries. That read into my ketogenic diet book. And, and so, so the, the ultimate diet, too, was aimed at lean individuals. And it was to allow maximal fat loss while either sparing muscle loss or actually allowing for muscle gain. Now, a lot of what that book gets into that you, you brought up <clears throat> is that the hormonal, like the optimal situation for fat loss, the optimal situation for muscle gain are distinctly opposed, right? <clears throat> for fat loss, you need a caloric deficit, a certain hormonal profile, 
the muscle gain, you need a surplus, a certain hormonal profile. And so the way the diet is set up is rather than trying to half-ass it, which is what a lot of recomposition approaches do, where you're like, well, I'm going to be kind of anabolic and kind of catabolic. I'm like, it, it can work under certain circumstances, but most people just kind of end up pissing around and spinning their wheels. Like rather than doing that, rather than being like, I'm going to have a little bit, oh God, I read this book one time, like calories, like body composition for athletes. This was their recommendation after a hard workout. If you wanted to gain muscle, have 300 calories after the workout. If you wanted to lose fat, only have 200. Brilliant stuff. Just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Or another one that was like, oh, just do cardio after your hypertrophy workout, and that way you can burn fat and gain muscle. Great stuff, folks. Anyways, the ultimate diet two, first I took the 10-day cycle and compressed it in seven days because the 10-day cycle is a pain in the ass for most people because we work on a seven-day work week. And what I did was rather than this pissing about middle range thing, it has a explicit fat loss phase, which is Monday through Thursday-ish, where you're on low calories, low carbs, you're training in a way to mobilize fat, increase fat oxidation, to maximize that. And it's very much like, because after that, several years later, I wrote my rapid fat loss handbook. And like the low carb days are very similar to that. And I might, I might make those like true rapid fat loss days just to bring the calories down. So anyways, you have those four days that are diet days to maximize fat loss. Then you swing back into an anabolic phase where you use a setup workout to carb load to make sure muscle glycogen uh, is fueled up, which helps the protein synthesis. So that you can basically have these two heavy training workouts. One workout kind of sets you up for the Saturday workout so that you can either regain any lost muscle. And in looking back at it now, the risk of muscle loss on a diet is minimal if you do it right. And we can talk about that shortly. But anyway, you swing back to this anabolic phase where you've got enough calories to recover. So we're again, so rather than seven days of this half-assed pissing about, it's like, no, we're going to have a short diet and we're going to have a, an anabolic phase. It, it's just taking, you know, look at what bodybuilders do, six months of bulking or whatever, and then they do a contest diet. Well, you can compress that into a three-month phase where it's half and half, or a month phase where it's two and two. This compresses into a seven-day phase where it's four and three, or thereabouts. Um, so what would I change? Because in, in it, the way it's set up, the tension workout, which is Thursday to set up the carb load. Saturday is a power workout, which is a lot of very low repetitions. I would probably, in hindsight, make that more of like a, a tradi more traditional hypertrophy workout, just because heavy triples and fives take so damn long. I would probably do like, because the, the Monday, Tuesday workouts are for depletion. It's that miserable high rep stuff. And then the tension workout is six to eight, kind of traditional range. And I would probably make Saturday for bodybuilding more of a, um, if, if muscle gain was the, grow, the goal, I'd make that just probably another set, you know, maybe fives to eights, something in that. Just make it a little bit more of a traditional, just so it's not as long. Um, I mean, I do know, I, I wrote an addendum many, many years later and expanded it for power lifters. And I knew some powerlifters that use it to really great success. That I uh, just in my own personal experience, the rebound that I get in strength on that mm -hmm. power workout, oh god, yeah, that blew my absolute mind. And a lot of other people that I put on it as well, yep. they come back shocked saying how much stronger they are. I was handling the 60 kilo dumbbells and bench presses yep. like they were toys. Like they're yeah, they end up setting PRs on Saturday because you've got because the you know they truly you do truly set up for you know a, a glycogen super compensation where you and increase you know the carbs pull water into the muscle and your leverages are up and you're strong as hell and I do I know some powerlifters that used it to diet down to make weight and they set PRs like they just kept getting stronger all the way into the meat which is very I think there's some neurotransmitter upregulation as well because like your dopamine oh. is just firing and you're feeling so good on on that weekend carb up. Oh, no, absolutely. Yes. I mean, some people that find that those high carbs really do tend to make them a little bit groggy, but that's a very individual thing. I think that's very much an, an, an individual neurochemical thing. But yeah, but again, you know, you look at diet, uh, one of the certainly last frontiers that we don't know much about is going to be the brain and figuring out, you know, neurochemistry plays a humongous role, not only in performance, endurance performance, strength power performance, sprint performance, but there's also individual differences. 
uh, that I think will be found to play a major role in who responds to certain types of training and certain types of diet, sort of a, as an example. And I've looked a little bit into this because it's very interesting to me. So I'm a classical endurance athlete. I can just, I don't get bored. I can just go forever. Put, just put me on a bike, just go two out, just same pace. When I was speed skating, I had a, a teammate who was a sprinter, pure sprinter. He, the way we rode a bike was hilarious because I ride a bike like this. And he would have to go, if he wasn't changing constantly, his mind, his brain would fall off. And what I would find, and I'd read about this in Charlie Francis's book, like he would hit this huge like sprint PR and he would just be flat for a week and his hunger would go through the roof. And I'm like, and you look at what little data is there and it's like when you hit those big PRs and I'm like, I was absolutely convinced it was a dopamine depletion is the wrong word, but he just had suboptimal dopamine levels because he'd be flat for the next four or five days. And then finally he'd come back normal and then he'd be good. And then he hit another big P and Charlie Francis used to talk about that guy would hit, you know, huge sprint PR on a Monday and just be good for nothing for the rest of it. And I suspect also with that, you know, people who like, if you look at how strength power athletes typically train or sprint athletes, it's hard, easy, hard, easy. Endurance athletes are just, like, they just do the same damn thing every day. And I think a lot of that stuff probably came out of some of that neurochemistry. Some people get bored more easily in training. If you don't have a little bit of variety, and even there I've seen, like I said, I can do the same thing for nine months. Never get bored. I've had people that if you didn't change something like at least once a week, they would just lose interest. And I'm not saying, you know, mix it up and change the, like just change one exercise. And I've had other people that were like, eh, every four to six weeks, you know, I would have to switch out. Like if they're a power lifter, right? They're always going to do the big lifts. But I'm like, whatever, we'll do a different tricep exercise. We'll do a different, like, I don't care about that stuff, what I call donkey work. So there's that big difference. But I do think you're absolutely right. I think the average strength power athlete, there is a dopamine issue. And if they're on low carbs, they go flat. Everything, you know, leptin drops, they're dieting. When leptin drops, dopamine signaling goes down, all that stuff. But they are not in a position to uh, have a great workout. And then when you fill everything out and they're strong, and also, I mean, they feel good. You feel weak when you're dieting, especially on low carbs. You feel flat and stringy. If you're a bodybuilder, you look at yourself and go, oh, man, you look like shit. And you lose a lot of that. I mean, it's true. If you ever want to mess with somebody in your gym, some big guy, just go up and go, you lost weight. No, especially if they're contest dieting, they'll they'll go run to the buffet right then. Like you look smaller. I love the dose. That seg that discussion actually segues well into our next question because there was a question on the forum from Michelle Frillo. I think that's how she pronounces. It. Yep. She's done a few consults with you, and she's very interested in the aspect of neurobiology underpinning yep. obesity and dysregulated eating in female clients. And she said that. Consulting with you, you have a unique way of approaching this and raising the client's understanding and awareness to achieving their goals. Can you want to talk to that about that a little bit? So I think what she was getting at, so some of this comes out of, you know, there's the new weight loss drug, the Zempic, uh, Munjaro, called Zepbound, all the, the new GLP-1 drugs, which seriously, I better get another book written because these things are going to put me out of a job. And there's also this, you know, there's this unfortunate tendency in the fitness industry that I find very irritating. Make no mistake, listeners, I find everything irritating, including myself sometimes. So that doesn't mean anything. But they're just like, diet drugs, why don't you try discipline? Now, these are the same people that will take a dozen drugs, supplements, 600 milligrams of caffeine to get through their workout. But this stuff, you're just weak. You know, it's a crutch. And it's just like, fuck you. Why not try it? That's why I look at these people and go, well, then why don't you just try this one? Well, why do you need creatine or beta alanine or pre-workout? Well, this is, no, it's not different. Because what's happening with a lot in their life, they also play this game, well, you try diet and exercise? I'm like, it's not an either or. Like, make no mistake. Yes, people use diet pills and diet drugs and diet supplements in place of this. You and I have both known people that are like, I'm just going to take creatine and steroids and not work out. So like, what's the difference? To me, there is none. And the point I think she was, uh, this came up in my, in my Facebook group a little while back and someone played that little game. Well, you know, why not 
do this and that instead and just try life. I said, well, I said, well, oh no, I know what it was. Someone says, well, you need to go to therapy and find out the underlying basis of the overeating. And my comment was, well, what if the basis is a dysregulated neurochemistry that's related to eating? And that's what she, I think that's what she was asking about. Because, you know, ignoring the centuries, literally, of, you know, the sloth and glutton thing, you know, eating and overweight are moralized and always have been. I mean, it comes out of like staunch religion, that, you know, and there's that's still around. Ah, they're just lazy and eat too much. There's no doubt that people with overweight do tend to be less active and do tend to overeat in the modern environment. However, at least part of that is being driven by neurochemistry. And this isn't debatable. And actually, it lives in the dopamine system, since we were just talking about that part of it. Some people enjoy exercise more than others. Some people spontaneously show more meat than others. And this doesn't, like I said, this lives in the dopamine system. So what, I, what happens a lot, so the question then becomes, is right, you look at someone who's got overweight and they find whatever ways to measure these things. And it's like, okay, the question, and they find something is dysregulated, like the reward system, you know, which is dopamine and the opioids, and I'll come back to that in just a second. And they look at it and go, okay, there's a dysregulation. But what's the chicken and what's the egg? Did the dysregulation lead to the increase in body weight? Or did the increase in body weight lead to the dysregulation? And to ask the same question that I asked in the stupid video I put up today, where does the circle start? Because what other data, right? So we have the reward system, dopamine for simplistically how much you enjoy enjoyable things. And it can be food, sex, shopping, gambling, like anything that drives that reward system. There's also the opioid system. It gets into a bunch of nonsense about there's liking versus wanting. And it's not going to get into it, just the reward system. So in some of the data, they look at it and they go, oh, the reward system is hypersensitive. It is more responsive to rewarding things. People enjoy them more. But then they look at other data and go, huh, but this data says that it's less sensitive. It's They're responding less to it. What's going on? And the answer is probably this. Take someone who biologically, genetically, this starts at a young age, has a hypersensitive reward system. They enjoy enjoyable things more, whatever they may be. In a food sense, maybe they're a hyper taster. They have taste buds that respond. People do. Some people love sweets more than others. That is biological. Now, in the modern environment, they are going to be in maybe that same neurochemistry because it all tends to be tied together, probably means that they're less spontaneously active. They're less likely to enjoy activity. Now, the hardest would go, well, it's still a choice. They could still, well, yeah, they can, but most people are not going to if they don't have to. I mean, I got into sports young, but some of that for me was I grew up in the 70s. That's all you did, right? As an American child in the 70s, you play baseball. You play American football and play one season of football. I'm not, you know, you play soccer, whatever the rest of the world, civilized world call. That's what you do. You swim, you ride bikes because we didn't have the internet. And the video games then were not very good, um, even though I was a big gamer nerd, much to everyone's surprise. But anyway, so you put them in that environment. You don't have to do a lot of activity. I mean, we had PE. We had the freaking <laughs> president's physical fitness test, which was a dumb thing they made us do every year. But that certainly doesn't exist now. So you put someone like that in that environment. Well, they start to gain weight. As they gain weight, that feeds back into that system and starts to cause other issues. And this is very much like what happens in people who, substance abusers, drug addicts, alcohol addicts, smokers. Frequently, that system is more sensitive early on, right? So. The now drug addict, when they had their first hit or their first drink or whatever, it hit them like a hammer. And they liked it so much that they kept doing it. But as they did, kept doing it, the system started to downregulate. 
which is why they have to keep escalating. They have to keep escalating their doses to get the same effect. I had a, an addiction uh, pharmacology class I took one, uh, one time. The first professor was an addiction professor. And he goes, and he did research, but also worked in like uh, in addiction treatment. And he said, any addict, they remember their first high because it was the first time their brain felt normal because it was balancing their neurochemistry. So from that point on, they're chasing that high for the rest of their life. And they get to the point they're using to simply feel normal. They don't even get high from because the system has become desensitized. And so you get into this, this big loop because what you typically do see is that when you diet people down and get them to lose weight, some of this reverses. So clearly part of it is an adaptation to the overeating and the weight gain. And we know there's other things going on in terms of like you can get inflammation in the brain from overeating. You can get changes in, oh man. I don't remember what it was, in all these systems that occur in response to overeating that make it more difficult. Again, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it does make it more difficult. So a lot of my, which is a long way to get back to the question, the issue I have with this hard-headed approach, the, why don't you just try diet and exercise first to find the cause? Well, if the cause is neurochemical, if someone is fighting against this just drive, if using a drug helps them to make the lifestyle changes, helps them to lose weight, to start to reverse some of these adaptations, I don't see how that's a bad thing because it may be addressing a root neurochemical or biological cause. That is, yeah, and again, look, I get it. I am, I do believe in free will sometimes. Well, depends on when you ask me. Uh, we're not getting into the Sapolsky thing about whether or not humans have free will. Because it doesn't matter. Like, yes, I believe in personal choices, absolutely. But that doesn't make them easy. And there are certain things where there is such a strong biological driver that's saying, yeah, just, just eat less and exercise. Well, it's been decades. And that has not worked well for most people. If these drugs facilitate that by, again, whether shoring up the neurochemical dysregulations or help allowing people to develop the habits, right? And I look at it the same way that in, in a mental health standpoint. And some of your listeners may or may not know, you know, I've suffered with, well, not suffered. Uh, I have bipolar too. You know, like, do you suffer from insanity? Nope. Enjoy every minute of it. Regardless, is, yeah, is therapy super critical and super important for mental health treatment? Absolutely. It works better with medication. Because for some people, and I've known some that dealt with, you know, severe depression, you need the meds to get out of bed and actually go to therapy and do the work. And to me, why wouldn't you use every tool available to help someone? And like I said, these drugs are game changers. They absolutely are. So I think that's what she was getting at, was me taking this approach in that sense of like, look, this is neurochemistry. It also doesn't ever completely go away which is a whole separate thing. Because the other one, you're like, well, what happens if you come off the drugs? Well, that's just it, you don't. Treatment is, obesity is being reconceptualized as a chronically relapsing condition, right? The under, like, until they come up with a cure, unless the ketamine and the LSD stuff works out, right? There is no cure for bipolar. I will be on meds and for the rest of my life. Am I happy about it? Not particularly. I mean, do I want to be on medication? No, absolutely not. But I know it's behind door number two if I'm not. And that's just, and, and, and obesity is, but obesity is now where mental health treatment was three decades ago. Why don't you just try harder? Have you tried not being depressed? Have you tried not being bipolar? Yeah, have you tried getting fucked? Um, it's just not that, so like, again, I'm not dismissing the personal choice thing, but so many of the things that we do are driven neurochemically. We can override them to a degree. So maybe we should talk about the free will thing. That's Sapolsky's whole deal. Here's just a random note, random piece of trivia that does tie into this about how much our brain and our neurochemistry determines how much of this. One, they've shown that differences in brain function actually correlate with like political leaning, whether you're right wing or left wing. I, I couldn't tell you which part of it, but I came across this weird series of three case studies and it was three people that had the exact same uh, part of their brain damaged. It was very localized, this one little spot. 
And all three of them became what are known as foodies, meaning that they became, they went from not like food, you know what a foodie is, right? Where they're just like, these are people that just, that's all they think about. They're obsessed with it. That's all they care about. They weren't before. And this one localized lesion to their brain, all three of them were now. I'm not saying there's deterministic. There are obviously parts of our brain that allow us to make choices. But in that specific case, there was no choice to be had. That one, sec that one section of the brain, that was the foodie part of the brain. People who are born that are foodies are going to be like that. And there's nothing you can do about it. I'm not saying that weight gain is the same. Obviously, people can and do lose weight by making choices, changing their environment, lifestyle, etc. But they're to deny the underlying biology of that, or how big of a driver it can be in some cases. Um, to me, is like I said, why not use every tool if possible? I mean, shit, put these drugs in the water supply. I mean, hell, put DNP in the water supply. But that's my solution. But nobody listens to me. Um, I mean, hell, they put they put Adderall in the water supply. I think it'd be a much function, more functional world. That's all side effect. I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, I think you jokingly referred on one of the comments. You said that uh, humans and animals can be trained with click training. So I sometimes wonder how much of the behavioral determinants of pain and pleasure ultimately drive and override these neurobiology determinants as well. Um, I mean, we are, you know, the, 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 that, those pathways are obviously critical. You know, behaviorism was huge in the early 20th century. Then it kind of fell out of favor, but it's, we're coming right, you know, we're coming back to it. Like, it's funny how many articles I'm reading now that are like, yeah, it, it's not all of it. And that was the problem. When like Skinner fell out of, uh, out of favor, it was kind of like, well, you know, reinforcement can't explain all learning, ergo it must not explain any. And I'm like, that's kind of dumb. There, it's part of it's part of it. It's part of you know, we have genetics, we have imprinting. Obviously, and I mean, and that's just easy to look at. Look at how much the history of the world belies the idea that reward and punishment aren't part of our behaviors. Like it's silly to even what are laws? They are a threat of punishment if you break the rules. What are getting a tax return? That's a reward for doing what you're supposed to. Like, we get paid to go to work. You don't get paid if you don't go to work. You know, it, it is the, the, every school, you know, that's how you teach. That's how you do everything. That's how, to a degree, when we coach people in the gym, we need to make it rewarding on some level. Now, another thing, again, I happen just happen to have been looking into this recently to improve my click training skills, um, which I'll explain briefly what that means here in a second, just because it's funny, um, is I think where a lot of people went wrong is they think of reward as, oh, it needs to be a like physical item. Oh, you did this? Here's a cookie. Here's a dollar. Here's a gold star. and that was certainly the way Skinner looked at it because he was studying pigeons in a box and the rewards for, you know, simple animals are basically food, water, warmth, sex. I read a really funny paper about sex as a reward. And I haven't figured out how to really work that into training or eating, but give me some time. Um, I mean, I kid you not, they like let rats run mazes and there's a receptive female at the other end and they run faster. It's just that simple. Anyway, um, and then, you know, punishment is an electric shock or an air puff to the face and stuff like that. Like, that's great. Humans are slightly more complicated. Maybe not as, not as much as we like to think, but we are slightly more. So for humans, lots of things can be rewarding. And including internal feelings, including a feeling of accomplishment, include, even a coach going, hey, at, you know, Good job, at a boy. You know, for some athletes, seeing progress, seeing a PR, that is rewarding. That's why a lot of teams, I don't know if they do this in Australia, but here with football teams, they have like the, the board for like the high school boys. And it's like, oh, you made the 300 pound bench, which is about 140 ish kilos, right? They have like the 300, 400, 500 club, and you get a t shirt or whatever. It is a reward. It is a way, you know, it can be come from your teammates or your colleagues. It can be money. It can be external. And there's a whole lot of debate over whether external rewards or, you know, internal rewards and you know, the self-determination theory and this whole other topic that's humongous mess. And it's actually 
what most people think is going on with that. Is it really? But that's neither here nor there. And, you know, different people have different motivational styles. People, because that's another one the fitness thing does. Oh, you sh it's better to be intrinsically motivated than extrinsically motivated. Well, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But if someone is not intrinsically motivated, you can't just go, hey, you, be more intrinsically motivated. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? For some people, at least initially, there may have to be extrinsic motivation. Whatever works, right? I'm very much a pragmatist in this regard. If getting someone to come to the gym long enough to get a benefit, to start getting an internally rewarding feeling in the sense of I'm getting stronger. I had a client years ago who came in, typical female, I want to lose weight. And weight loss is slow. And a month later, she came in and she was just glowing. And I'm like, what's up? She goes, I went hiking with my family. This is the first time I've been able to carry my kids and keep up with my husband and not be exhausted. Suddenly, she got a very meaningful to her. And that's also important. What is rewarding to me may not be rewarding to you, may not be rewarding to a, a client. This is a problem with a lot of the research. They give everyone the same reward. Well, of course, some people are money driven. Some people are power driven. Some people are sex driven. Some people are, it just depends. Um, some of that, but yeah, that was for her. She was like suddenly had this internally sense of achievement that was meaningful to her because it was related to her family. So click training. Click training is the thing you do with animals. Uh, they first did it with dolphins and basically use a clicker to mark a behavior, right? So you get a little clicker and like so with my dogs, like you get, you know, you click, treat, click, treat. And what it, what, what that, what happens is in their little brains, the click predicts the reward. So they start, so they do what you want to do, sit. Because with animals, if you don't let them know what they're being rewarded for in about a second, they can't put it together, right? If a dog sits down and you wait 10 seconds and go, good job, they don't know what they're being rewarded for other than being a dog. So you use, so if you're training them from a distance, that's why they do it with dolphins, right? Like how do you reward a dolphin that's on the other side of the pool with the clicker? As soon as they do the flip, you go click and that's the reward. Then they can get the fish later. So with humans to a degree, we do do this as a coach. And there is actually, there's a group that did it with gymnastics and they call it teaching with acoustic guidance, tag training. Because I think they didn't want to tell the parents, oh yeah, we're click training your kids like dogs. But that's what they were doing. Because what they want to do, right? So that you've got a female gymnast and you're trying to teach her some very complicated trick. You need to let her know as soon as she hits that position, she hits a handstand, click. You need, it needs to be immediate, right? So when you're coaching someone in the gym or when I'm coaching someone, trying to prove a technical skill, as soon as I see them do it, immediately, yes. I want to hit them with it as quick because I need them to associate. I mean, yeah, you can tell them afterwards. Humans are different. I can tell you a week later, hey, you know, that workout last Saturday, really fantastic. Want to, like, whatever. You get, kid gets good grades on a Monday. You take him out for pizza on a Saturday. Humans can link those when animals can't. It's still better to do it right away. You want to let them know instantaneously that what they did was right. And you could, you could use a clicker. I know people that have done it. Um, I tried it with a couple of my athletes, believe it or not. Problem was they started, rather than just doing the task, they started listening for the clicker. They were, they, they, they stopped focusing on what they were doing and started focusing on, on that, which, so I, I hadn't, but yeah, you absolutely can. I mean, reward punishment. I mean, I'm, I did some time volunteering at an animal shelter and I'm generally a believer in positive reward positive reinforcement, like the old punishment model of training. For animals, not really. I mean, you, they use it under certain, I'm sure for military, I'm sure for certain things they have to use it. Like, you know, the common thing in American sport, American football, it's like, oh, you lost a game. You got to go to, uh, you know, wind sprints for an hour. I'm going to punish you because you like, I mean, okay not how I would approach, you know, it's the, oh, I used to see it when I was speed skating. Some, somebody would have a bad race and their coach would be like, you got to give me 25 laps because you skated badly. Well, they probably skated badly because they're too tired. How does making them more tired help? Like, I just don't, I don't believe in that approach. I don't believe in the punishment approach to things, but I mean, it has its place. 
But um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So I don't think you can deny that that reward and punishment plays an enormous role. And going back to the eating thing and the reward system, because I think this is important. Part of the issue with eating and alcohol and all substances of, abuse, of misuse, normally we think about rewarding someone or using reinforcement or conditioning. It is for a behavior. Okay, you got a good grade. I'm going to buy you something, whatever it is. You are rewarding the external behavior. Eating is rewarding in its own right because the act of eating rewards the act of eating. Now, it may also be rewarding something else, right? Oh, you got whatever you won. Another thing they used to do in the US, uh, if you won your baseball game, you, you got to, you went for pizza. It was a very popular thing with kids. Oh, and I don't know what happened when we lost. I don't remember. Regardless, food can reward other behaviors, but it is rewarding in its own right. Eating tasty foods tends to reward eating tasty foods. And if that happens to be rewarding another behavior, you start creating this really detrimental behavior chain. So, for example, people who stress eat, right? You usually see a situation or... It can also be you know, women who eat during PMS. You're like, all right, you're a kid. You're having a bad day. Mom comes and goes, oh, I'm sorry. Here, have a piece of cake. You'll feel better. Well, you do. One, hormonally, uh, comfort foods actually improve stress hormones. Uh, it actually physiologically it makes you feel better. But it's rewarding. It makes you feel better. So what have you just learned? That eating cake when you're stressed makes you feel better. You have just created an emotional eater, or you started the process of creating an emotional eater. So the next time you're stressed, well, your body will go, well, it will start to trigger that reward seeking. And every time you do it, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And then you can Especially just- Especially with the intensity of the emotions, like you said, there was stress or with the reward of the happiness of winning, it seems to lay down those neural pathways even stronger. Oh, absolutely. And it's also actually, you bring up a really interesting point is that in addition to making you physiologically feel better, escaping negative thoughts is inherently rewarding. So if you're in a bad mood, it is the food itself is rewarding because food is rewarding because it tastes good. It is rewarding because it is impacting your stress hormones. It is also triply rewarding because it is allowing you to escape the negative emotions. So it can very, very, very rapidly start, and it becomes automatic. And it actually becomes absolutely habitual because that's, I mean, that's also, it's, it's going back to this idea that, that, um, you know, that rewards don't play a huge role in this. So if you read the conditioning literature, which I highly do not re recommend, it is some, it is some dense, turgid stuff, even by my standards. And what they talk about is that behaviors are conditioned either to occur or not occur when a behavior results in a consequence. Consequence is rewarding. That behavior will tend to happen more frequently, right? If a pigeon pecks a, pecks a key and it gets a piece of food, it will peck the key more. It pecks the key and it gets an electric shock, it will very rapidly stop pecking the key. Well, even there, humans are unique. I'll come back to that too. Humans will do stuff that anybody else would consider punishing, right? A rat would never run to exhaustion and see that as a reward. Humans will do it every day because we can consciously parse that as this is getting me closer to my goal, which goes back to the whole thing of reward is very individual, right? If coming out of the workout exhausted makes you think you are making progress towards your goal, that is rewarding. To someone who's like, I hate working out, it will be very punished. So, but anyway, so going back to the, the, the food. So yeah, then you, you read the habit literature, which is a little bit easier to read. They said that habits are formed when some behavior results in a positive consequence. And I'm like, well, that's just conditioning in different language, right? When we form habits, it's because something that we did was either moved us towards a goal, did something that we wanted to achieve, or was enjoyable, right? So an example I've, I've used, think about when you're trying to learn how to drive a car. It's a lot of steps. It's a lot of work. And it takes a lot of thought. But the reward, either in the short term or the long term, is worth doing it. 
until it becomes completely habitual, which is why you get into your car and you end up driving somewhere without even realizing where the hell you are because you've driven that route so long. It is on total autopilot, and that can happen with eating too. Stress eaters will just reach for their comfort food with no thought involved because it has become such a well-worn um, neurological pathway, and they just get stronger and stronger and stronger, presumably up to some threshold. Um, and it, I mean, it is, it's, and there's other things you can get into. Here's just to give another, another interesting thing. Um, when you talk about reward and so you get into what's, there's, there's what are called continuous reinforcement schedules. We get rewarded every single time. Every time you do something good, you get a reward. That tends to cause behaviors to get established the most quickly. Then there's what are called, there are um, variable reinforcement schemes, and there's different kinds where you only get reinforced every so often. Those take longer to establish the habit, but they're much harder to get rid of. And think, and you can think about that, right? Like, so think about your rat in the maze. Every time you run down the maze, you get a, a pellet of food, 100% of the time. So the first time you go down and that pellet's not there, you go, huh, something's wrong. Second time, it's not there, huh. Third time, yeah, I'm done. But if you go down and it's every, 50, it's every other time, 50%, once that's established, if you go down and it's not there, you go, yeah, maybe this is one of the non-times. Next time, yeah. And then maybe if the third time it's there, you go, that resets the system. Then you look at gambling, which is one of the most addictive things. And casinos basically set it up so that you win about 49% of the time. It's just often enough that you'll keep going forever, but not often enough that they lose money. You also get into something called a jackpot, where if every once in a while that reward is much bigger, Right, we do that with the dog, with your dog. You're trying to train your dog something, and it's like, all right, first time, treat, 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 ten times in a row. All right, now we're gonna go every fourth, every seventh, or you know, whatever, every third time, and then every once in a while, hot dog. Their little brains are going, well, I should do this just in case, because maybe I'll get a reward, or maybe I'll get a jackpot, and that's so in gambling. So I was talking about this with um, a therapist friend of mine. And he was like, yeah, when I was in school, we talked about this. They had this casino uh, guy come in and talk to us about this, about how profoundly addicting gambling is. And, and the guy apparently was there going, should we tell him? Yeah, let's tell them. Apparently across a typical shift in a casino, they have to pull five or six chairs out to wash the pee and poo out of them. People will not get up and go to the bathroom because they are so addicted to this activity, which is actually the last thing we can move on about the reward thing. Anyone who says the conditioning doesn't work, every mobile game, they studied this. Those things are just little Skinner boxes. They are, because they are. I don't know if you play, I know you said you don't play video games, but if you play any of those things, the ones that use microtransactions to make millions a day, Candy Crush Saga at one point was making a million dollars a day, U.S., a day. And here's how they work. First five or six boards, you win without trouble. You get lots of shiny lights and rewards, and you're a winner, and you're awesome, and this and that and the other, and just like ding, 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 ding. And then next level a little bit harder. And then you win a couple. And then it's a little bit harder. And then you can use something and ask for a little help. And then, wow, I just run a big one. You get a reward, a huge jackpot. And then the next five levels are just impossible to get through. And for a lot of people, that's when they start spending money. These things. Sounds like the Tinder dating system. What's that? It sounds like the Tinder dating system right yeah, there. I mean, yes. I mean, there's, there's no doubt. Or just look at social media. Tell me, anyone listening to this, back when Facebook, before it started really dying, tell me that hearing that little. Facebook notification didn't give you a little joy, especially if you knew. I mean, that's people live on social media for the likes, for the heart reacts, because it is absolutely addictive. It is at, for people with that addictive personality, that addictive neurobiology, which kind of goes back to what we're talking about the food thing. There are differences in this regards, right? Some people need it. I mean, truly need it. These are the people that go onto Instagram and put up a picture going, eh, 
not feeling very pretty today because they want to get 100 people telling them how great they are. And yeah, I mean, just like I said, they're not dummies. They know this stuff works and it does. And some people are more prone to it than not. And unfortunately in the, in the world, and even dieting, you can look at, it is frequently a variable reinforcement schedule. Because what are people doing? They're restricting their food intake until they crack. And, and it's always a matter of when, not if. And every time they do, they're rewarding themselves actually in a very weird way for breaking their diet, right? And, and that's a really, like, think about it in that, like, what they're now rewarding themselves for is first restricting and then relaxing. Well, what's going to happen? They're going to more frequently alternate between restricting and cracking. And even if that eating causes guilt and shame, which it frequently does, well, what happens then? They eat more to escape the negatives. Right? All they're doing is creating this weird schedule where they are reinforcing, relaxing their restraint, feeling, and then they eat, and then they get guilty, and then they reward themselves for feeling guilty, for having rewarded themselves, for having relaxed their restraint, and it's becoming a habit. It's becoming a programmed pattern. It's very hard to break, obviously. I know the dangers as well because typically when you compete for a bodybuilding competition, you store and hoard and gather all this post-competition food so that as soon as you walk off the stage at the end, you are into your little uh, reservoir of treasures. Oh, yeah. The morning, I, of, the morning of one of my contests, I sort of thought, oh, just a little bit can't hurt, and I ended up devouring the whole thing the, before I stepped on stage yeah. and consequently lost the contest. So. Yeah, and for a lot of people, and that, I think that's something we can maybe you know roll around to this in terms of you know some flexible dieting ideas because I was definitely the first person to write about that, is for some people, there is no a little. Right. For some people, it is actually uh, it, one researcher I saw the way they phrase it is that it's easier to not eat anything at all than to stop eating once you've started. And that is very true for many, 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 many people. Right. And I mean, I'm like this. There's things that if I keep, you know, once I start, I'll eat all of it. And if I never taste it, I'll be fine. And that is that is the case for many people. Now, you're looking at a, a different situation. I mean, contest bodybuilders starve themselves down to the absolute nth of leanness. I mean, you are literally starving yourself to near death. You are in a whole different place neurochemically. But there is no food control. Um, although I'll be curious. It'll be interesting to see if uh, bodybuilders start using some of these new appetite suppressant drugs rather than, mm. you know, what they used to. I think to they definitely already are, yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard just, before too. Oh. If we can just change gears a little bit, uh, because we have like a, a one of the forum user yeah, questions. I'm and he was talking about, you know, 50 years ago, we had Arnold and the gang, they're doing volume for the sake of doing volume because they didn't really know any better. But now, despite all the science and the research, we're ironically back to where we started with yeah. so many in the industry wrapped up in this tedious volume preoccupation. How the hell did we end up back at square one again, despite all this research? I mean, what I've seen over the years, right? So again, in the Arnold days, a lot of it was, you know, I think the drugs really colored so much of it in terms of what you could just get away with. Because even through that, if you look at, you know, drug-fueled bodybuilding at the pro level, in the 70s, everyone just did lots of volume. Although, did they really? If you're training a muscle group once a week and doing about 20 sets per muscle group, is that really that different than what we're doing now? Not enormously, right? Then you had Arthur Jones and Mike Menser that were pushing lower volumes. Although, even there, um, if you look at Arthur Jones' original work, not Menser, who he started really the process of, of really confusing the issue about what what was going on. You actually go back and look at Arthur Jones as the Nautilus Bulletin number one, um, which it's surprisingly good. I mean, if you for for what it was, and his base routine was nine heavy sets per week to failure, full body three times a week. I for the average person, I would probably get him a lot further than what most of them are doing in the gym. And if you go back even further than that, you know, you look about look at what the guys were doing, you know, pre seventies. It was moderate volumes, generally depending on the person and the philosophy, and they focused on getting strong in a moderate repetition range, and they got they got bigger. But then drugs entered the picture and allowed a lot of goofy bullshit to work. Um, 
yeah, and there was another observation Duchesne made one time. They, I think the IFBB decided to test the Olympia one year, or maybe it was, might have been WBF. IFBB, yeah. IFBB, yeah. Lee Haney and all that. And everybody Lee Haney ended up looking like shit. And just interestingly oh. to that point as well, you mentioned Mora Di Pasquale's anabolic diet before. Yep. When they had the WBF competition that Vince McMahon was running, yes. they had to have that drug tested. So they ran all those bodybuilders back then, except for maybe Gary Stryden, clean, yeah. but using that anabolic diet. And they all ended up looking like absolute shit. Yeah. And, and Duchesne really commented. He said when he saw that, he realized how many mistakes the drugs were really covering up for. Training and nutrition had devolved at that point because y- you could get away with so much. Um, and it, it, so, yeah, so you look in the pr- pre-drug era, it was, you know, moderate volumes, moderate repetitions, um, and people just got stronger in that repetition range, and they got bigger. And they, they would, you know, they were experimenting with a lot of different things even then to see what was going on. And then Arnold in it, but even even through the drug era, you know, Haiti was more moderate volumes, you know, uh, stimulate, don't annihilate was his thing. Um, and then, you know, obviously Dorian Yates was at the lower end of the volume things, although people, not as low as people think. The, again, you were online too watching, you know, all the endless high intensity training versus volume and periodization debates. Oh, how tedious. They're still around, the HIT Jedis. And I mean, I wrote for Cyberpump. I was kind of like, eh, it's a tool. Like it's got its, it's, got its place, um, depending on what you're trying to do. And he'll tend to claim Dorian. But if you look at his actual training, it's not nearly as low volume as you think. What he, what people, what he said was he only did his one top set to failure of each exercise. That doesn't mean he only did one set to failure of each exercise because he was way too strong. He would come in and do three or four warm-ups. I would argue that maybe his final warm-up was probably a work set. Then he did one all-out set. He did usually four exercises per muscle group. And he was doing... 12, 15 sets per workout. Many were warm ups, but you know, the proverbial he warms up with your max. And yeah, you know, very much, he's very much a thinking man's bodybuilder. I think he, he did, you know, put a lot of, so his, his, his volumes are on the lower end. But again, when you're looking at the pro level, a lot of it, the drugs, you know, and then you had Ronnie with super high volume and he won as many Olympias too. And the difference being that Dorian, is still in pretty good shape in terms of not being a walking injury at this point in his life. And Ronnie, um, de- I mean, depressingly is, I mean, his, he, he paid the price for it, um, you know, for good or for bad. Some of which I think was an exercise training. But anyway, so, but, so here we are again, and I've been in the field long enough, you have too, to just have watched the cycles of, I mean, I've seen it in diet, right? So in the seventies, everyone died in low carb in the eighties, High carb, low fat. And then in the 90s, the zone and 30, 40, 30 nutrition. And then cyclical keto came back in. And then that fell out of it. Now I think most every diet cult has its own little subgroups. Like I don't, it used to be like everybody would switch just universally. And now I don't think that's the case anymore. Now it's echo chambers. What's that? Now it's echo chambers. Yeah, exactly. Um, And the same thing with training. Like, you can just kind of, like, set your damn calendar by it. So, for a while, you know, for whatever, the 2000s or whatever. I mean, I've been saying the same damn thing since 2002, since I just, like, nothing's changed until I see some really, you know, compelling data to change my entire philosophy to it. Um, and we can roll back to where I think some of the discrepancies are coming from. And then the volume thing started to build in the middle 2010s. And, you know, Brad's paper, 45 cents per week and blah, blah, blah. And then volume was the thing for five fucking years. And I was just like, no. And then I watched everybody kind of walk it back and walk it back. And, well, we're right back to 10 to 20 sets. I'm like, really? Um, and now I've been told that, like, Vincerian HIT is starting to make kind of a resurgence. I, I think this is, I mean, I'm... I, I will not, I'm not on TikTok. That's a lie. I have an account, but I'd never post, I would never post for other reasons. I just set something up to monitor somebody. Um, but like now, like, I mean, Instagram is, Facebook is for the old farts. Instagram is for the next. And then TikTok is for the Zoomers or whatever the hell they're calling. It. And I guess Mazarian HIT is starting to make a resurgence now. And I'm like, well, 
here we go again. <laughs> We're going to go, you know, everyone's going to jump from high volumes to low volumes and do that for a while. And which, you know, I would rather that, like maybe they'll actually learn to train hard rather than pissing about for 45 sets. Like at least maybe they'll come out of that having learned something. Probably not. And then it'll go, you know, right. And even with that, right. So last year I, I did, you know, one of my, okay, I think I did two videos last year because I just couldn't be asked. And I was like, oh, time to talk about volume again. And I'm like, here's what I was saying since 2018. And now here's what all the talking heads in the industry, here's what actually triggered it. It was when Mike Isretel, Mr. Volume, Mr. Defender of Brad Schoenfeld, did a video. Are you doing too many sets? Yeah, Mike, they are, because you told them to. You, this industry. So I did a video and I was like, okay, let's go back and let's talk about what happened. And everybody jumped on Brad's, Brad's paper. They claimed that 45 sets per week, even if Sizzik didn't support it, blah, blah, blah. And I go, and here's the thing. Nobody ever believed it. Nobody. Eric Helms wrote an article in Mass where he says, well, I think Brad's paper is good, but 10 to 20 sets. Like, sounds like- The irony know. is, Lyle, sorry. The irony is, Lyle, just to interrupt, is that Brad's latest book doesn't even have those volume recommendations in it. And they're, they're about 10 to, 10 to 15 to 20 sets per oh, week. Not even that. Well, unless he's got another new one. So, so during that whole thing, right, because my, my general approach, like I've got this thing called the generic bulking routine that I wrote 20 some odd years ago, and it was based on an old review paper by Warren Baum that was at the time kind of the, the most comprehensive data. And it's a basic upper lower split twice a week. It's about 14 to 16 sets, effective sets per muscle group. And I'm, by that, I mean, I'm counting... If you do heavy compound pressing, I count part of that volume for arms. So you do less sets for arms. Like it, it, but it ends up being right in that middle range. And then everybody shat on that meta-analysis for a bunch of years. And then somehow we keep coming back to that. Where it's like, because what he found was about 40 to 70 repetitions per workout twice a week gave optimal growth. Somewhere in that range. Like it was kind of a curve. Less reps gave you some. More reps actually gave you a little bit less because I think you do get into junk volume. And, and I'm like, all right, you know, you count that up. You're doing sets of eight. Well, 40 to 70 reps, that's what, five to eight sets to failure? And I'm like, yeah, that's about right. And then everybody got away from that and jumped on Brad's thing. And like I said, he never even believed it. And then, but during all that, everyone was like, oh, Lyle's just a low volume guy. <laughs> I'm not. And so Brad's book, Max Muscle 2.0, is that the one you're talking about? Or is it another one? Right. Yep. Someone got me a copy of it because they know that I like being angry because that's, that's the only reason I would have gotten it. And the majority of the workouts are nine sets per week. And six during the deload because everyone needs a deload every fourth week. Sure. Nine sets per week. There is one phase, which is a, more of the hypertrophy training, which is 14 which is okay. And then there's a grand overreaching phase with all of 22 sets for two weeks. I'm like, oh, this didn't mention 45 sets anywhere. Why did everybody jump on this so hard other than because Lyle is mean? And that's really the reason. His ego couldn't handle me going, yeah, this is why this pay. They never believed it. None of them ever believed it. Even Brad in some seminar recently is like, yeah, he's recommending 20 to 25 sets per muscle group. Well, why not 45? Eric never gave you anybody 45. Neither did James. Uh, none of them, ever. But they had to defend Brad's paper against mean old me. But yeah, so like, okay, we're right back to that. About 10 to 20 sets per, hard sets per week. And then all of a sudden, the new bit of nonsense, the 52 set per week thing, and everybody jumped on that again. And what's funny, D'Souza, who's one of the researchers, I mean, whatever, people do have to realize that not all science is meant to be applied. And that is part of the problem with the, the online industry. And you have to do content daily. You have to jump on every new study that came out, even if it contradicts the one last week. There is no looking at the global body of data. And those individual studies tend not. So that one comes out and it's like, there's no such thing as junk volume, 52 sets per week, blah, 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 blah. It's like, did y'all actually read the paper? 
Because if you go actually read what the discussion, which is very important, and read the methods and read what they were doing, like some of it was just to test it. And they just wanted to see what happened. And frequently that's the case. If you're going to go read it, and for people who aren't don't know what we're talking about, it's a paper that came out end of last year. Yeah, something like that, out of D'Souza's lab. And so they took three groups, and they had them doing 22 sets of quad work a week. Quads only. It's very important. So 11 sets twice a week. Squats, uh, leg press, leg extension. They did two reps in reserve for the first batch of sets and then the last set to failure. And then one group added four sets a week for the next 12 weeks. So they added, so they went from 22 sets to, what is that, 42, something like that. Then the other group added six sets per week, and they ended up for the last two weeks at 52 sets per week. So 26 sets of quads twice a week. That's nine sets of squats. Eight to two reps short of failure, one to failure, same for leg press, and then eight of leg extension. And they looked at growth, and they were like, well, you know, the growth was a little bit better for the highest volume group, but certainly not in proportion with the amount of work that was being done. And that's in the discussion. And they looked at all the data, and they said, well, what it pretty much supports is that moderate volumes pretty much tend to win out front to back, no matter what you do. But what got left out of that discussion and what always gets left out of these discussions, it was quads only, right? They did like three sets of hamstrings for reasons. I forget what they were. They were like, since most workouts include posterior chain work, we did like four sets of, it's like two of leg curl and two of RDLs or something like that. There was no upper body training given. They were just allowed to do whatever. And okay, great. Let's say, and everybody was burnt out by the end of it because that's just... <laughs> Let's say it gave better growth. Let's just say it didn't, or not enough to, to justify the time. How are you going to apply that? How are you going to apply 52 sets to roughly eight major muscle groups? Right? Chest, back, delts, biceps, triceps, that's seven, quads, hamstrings, glutes, I mean calves, right? nine muscle groups. Are you going to do 450 sets per week? Jeff Nippard's new program will show you how. That's that's how. Every time the research sneezes, he he releases a new program. Ooh. Oh yeah, yeah. I love the high frequency fad too. That was funny. That was when he punted out of my group. He got real butt hurt over me. But what you talked about there, Lyle, with the quads only, it kind of was a light bulb moment for me in your recommendations for training because no one ever mentions about. Well, they are now because they're ripping off your work again but specialization routines. Right. Because we're all under this erroneous assumption for years that you can bring up every body part equally after the intermediate stage with the same amount of work with and it, with the same expectation that it's going to be equal growth. But right. you said, no, you need to cut the rest back to maintenance and apply these specialization phases. So can you just speak to that a little bit more? Because people sure. want to know that. So my unpopular opinion that eventually everyone will realize that I'm right about is that as you get more advanced, you need less volume. And nobody is willing to believe that yet. But trust me, give it a few years. They always realize it. Because the idea is that, oh, as you get more advanced, you need more volume. Well, you know, where that came from was from the Russians. Because as the Russians got more advanced, they did use higher volumes of steroids. They were able to keep ramping volume up and up and up, and they broke most of their athletes. But if you look at like actual sports, and don't get me wrong, like I, I kind of shit on bodybuilding because it's not a sport, but it's a fascinating to me. I mean, I've the problems endlessly fascinating. I and mean, I think all sports are boring and dumb. I'm the the problems interest me more so than I don't I'll watch skateboarding. Anyway, is if you look at sports performance, generally speaking, as people get more advanced, they do less. Because I would really love for someone to tell me how, say, Ray Williams, who's squatting a thousand pounds raw, or Jesus Olivares, who just did 1036, some ungodly, it's like 479 kilos, some ungodly squat. Are you really going to tell me that he's going to squat six days a week? Are you really going to tell me that he's going to squat? No, they squat once a week for low to moderate volumes, because that's all you can fucking survive. So as you get more advanced as a bodybuilder, as a pat like, Assuming you're trying to work at the higher ends of volumes and higher ends of intensities, it can't be done 
I mean, it just, you, you simply don't have the energy to get through a fold, much less to recover from that. So the way I've always approached it, right? And again, if you look at most sports, right? So when you start, you do low volumes and low as you're learning the sport. And in the middle, you typically do the highest volumes and the highest intensities. But as you're getting to higher and higher and higher levels, those same maximal efforts are taking so much more out of you. Right, again, Charlie Francis wrote about this. He goes, look, if you're running a sub 10 second hundred, that is taking so much more out of you physically, neurologically, nervous system than someone running a 12.5. As you get faster, you can impose the same thing. Yes, technically a 400 pound 1RM squat and a 1,000 pound 1RM squat are both a 1RM. But is anyone really gonna believe that, that the 400 and the 1,000 are gonna take the same amount out of you? Like is Ray Williams really gonna do a lot of volume with say 850 pounds on his back? No, he's not, can't be done. There's also the factor with that as you get more advanced, you get better at expressing intensity in terms of your ability to get more out of a given set on top of it being heavier, in terms of being able to push yourself deeper. Um, do you know who Scott Abel is? I'm sure you do, you know the name. Sorry, I lost you there for a second, Lyle. It just no cut doubt. out. Okay. Um, did, did that lose any of my video? Um, it, it might still record it on the, on the back end, but if you just wanted to start it back about... Okay. Uh, well, just, basically, I was just kind of talking about how as you go brain. from beginner to more advanced, beginner, lower volumes, lower intensities, you're learning the activity. In the middle, you tend to see the highest volumes. As you get more advanced, you simply can't do it because the absolute loads are heavier of whatever you're doing. Um, but also, as you get more advanced, you get better at expressing intensity, being able to get more out of every set. Now, there's a funny story about Dorian. Apparently, someone came to film for Blood and Guts. And the, the, ca the cameraman like had his thumb up his butt. And Dorian did a set of back. And they missed it. The guy said, can you do that set again? And Dorian went, no, come back in a week. Because you don't get it. You actually work this hard. You cannot... Even if you wanted to do more than one set, you couldn't. Now you can do a bunch of submaximal piss about volume, but there is limited recovery in those terms. How can you do that? Like let's oh like let's assume let's assume that you need to be increasing volume as you go. All right, so you're a beginner. You do three sets per muscle group three times a week, about nine sets a week. In your intermediate level, fifteen sets per week per muscle group. All right, beginner advanced. You're at 20. We're now at 160 hard sets a week. Right? Assume eight muscle groups. Where do you go from there? Now you're advanced. Are you going to do 25 sets for every muscle group? Are we going to go up now to 100 and what's that? 80 times 25, 60. Are we up to 200 hard sets per work per week? And then 250? Like where does it stop? And the answer, and it can't. You get to a point that you cannot physically put enough energy and intensity into everything to get a training stimulus. And we could wave hands, you know, there is whatever, however much recovery ability you have and adaptation ability you have. And like, there's only so much that you can recover from. So there are still people that are like, ah, you just keep training everything hard and high volume. I'm like, how, how can you do it? So I always approach that for advanced people with specialization cycles. The idea being that, look, you're not, it's kind of like the dieting thing we were talking about early on. You can train, try to train all your muscle groups, and you just end up piss-assing all of it because it just cannot be done. I mean, look at how many people can't even train quads and hamstrings in the same workout because if you train quads heavy, you're not going to leave a lot for hamstrings. And I get that's why, I mean, all the various split routines. There's a reason people often do quads and hands on different days, things of that nature. That's an, but that's the advanced level. The average person is not working that hard and less so for other muscle groups. So the way I approach specialization is, look, pick, you want to put all of your effort, all of your training, all of your intensity, all of your focus, all of your recovery into two muscle groups. So you pick two, and I typically do either one larger, one smaller, more light, more typically one upper, one lower, just because that tends to, to work better. But like you could do like chest and biceps or something. Like don't do quads and hamstrings. <laughs> you don't probably want to do quads and back. Um, that, that's just, you can't do a bunch of big muscle groups. And what you do is you work those at full volume, full intensity. You just hammer them. And I don't, one thing other people do that I don't 
is they will like bump the volume and the intensity. But I'm like, well, why? If we know that 16 to 20 hard sets a week is a training load, why would you automatically do more? It's not that I do more for specialization muscle groups. I do less for everything else. So those go down to maintenance volumes. And again, someone, I think it was James Krieger, did uh, some Instagram thing last year. It was like, oh my God, you only need four sets to maintain a body part. I'm like, wow, that sounds familiar. I've been saying you can cut volume by two thirds since what, 2003? And you will maintain, right? So if you're doing 12 sets per week per muscle group, you can do like four sets a week and you will maintain your muscle mass for extremely extended periods of time, as long as you train at the same intensity. And that's the key. If you start to look at some of the detraining literature and some of the tapering literature, you can cut volume, you can cut frequency. You can't cut intensity, right? If you cut the load on the bar, if you work, if you don't work as hard, you will lose fitness. So, I recently drove around Australia and uh, I was, wasn't in any gyms for four months and all I had was a pair of uh, you know, gymnastics rings. Yep. So I did some calisthenics. When I got back to the gym, I'd barely lost any muscle yep. and definitely hadn't lost any strength. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think, been overstated like how quickly you tend to lose that stuff, but it just takes minimal amounts of training. So you cut all everything else, all the non-specialization muscle groups back to like three or four sets and it allows you to really put all of your energy into those two muscle groups. And then you do that for four to six, maybe six weeks. And then you switch and you switch to two other muscle groups that were in maintenance and you bring them up and you just rotate through over the course of a year. And it's interesting. I've, uh, there's a, a guy I consult with in the UK. who's a probably a physique competition here before too long. Now he's a big time HIT guy, big time trains, balls out, two failure, two limits. And actually I want to come back. There's another thing I've got about all that volume research that I, a fascinating contradiction I find in the industry, but I'll come back to that. And like, that's just it. Some people aren't good at stopping short of failure. They just want to, you know, I talked about, he likes to wreck himself. That's just how he trains. That's how he knows how to train, but he does very low volumes. He does like four sets per muscle twice a week. He's also very advanced. And he's at the point, I go, all right, we need to do specialization cycles. So very much the same thing. And he increased the volume on his, uh, specialization work a little bit instead of you know four sets twice a week he does six five like we added it just a little bit because he's training so hard and cut everything else in half and what he ended up having to do actually was like my normal specialization cycle like a two-week submaximal run-up and then like four to six weeks pushing hard and then you stop he was one of those people that found if he does a submaximal run-up he just spins his wheels. He's like, he just, he falls back so far, he never gets any further. So his his deload is he just cuts his sets in half, which is, I believe, kind of what Dorian did. He just cut his volume in half. So for him, two weeks easy and four weeks hard was not, or six weeks hard was not going to work. So he ended up doing two to three weeks hard, like truly hard. And then he would cut his volume one week and then two to three and one, which is the same thing. It's still two weeks easy and it's just distributed a little bit differently. And I mean, he's like, yeah, those, those lagging body parts, every time he's rotated around, kept coming up. Um, and I do different things with like, there's different ways to set up the maintenance, like the way you set up the workouts. In some cases, you put both specialization body parts on the same workout. And you like do that twice a week and you do all the maintenance stuff on one day. Some people don't like that. And like, on like typical push-pull legs, like let's say you're doing chest. Well, you do chest specialization and you dealt tricep maintenance and same thing. There's That's one of these days I'll write it up in specific, but it's just that. And there's not, like I said, I think someone in the in the, the Facebook group too is like, would I change anything? Like, no, not really, because I don't see any need to. It works every time anyone I ever know has ever done it. Um, it allows them, and you just rotate through. And, I've, and every you, once in a while you rotate back, you've got a particularly lagging muscle group. But Do you think one good change might be because the question of exercise selection came up quite a bit? Yeah. And do you think that when you're doing a specialization phase, you might narrow down the uh, choice of exercise? I, I know that before yeah. you used to recommend or you said that it was a good program, the positions of flexion. 
because yeah, I, it had yeah. that combination of exercise selection and yeah, maybe maybe you'd employ that during a specialization phase. Yeah, I think absolutely because you know you're, since you're putting a little bit more volume in, you could or not. I mean, it would allow you to possibly select different exercises to get a little bit of different thing. And that gets into a whole separate issue. Like I tend to be a minimalist in terms of exercise selection. And I think that's because I can't ever think of enough useful exercises for a given muscle group. Place I worked years ago, they were like, drop a five exercise chest routine. I'm like, I can't think of five exercises that are worth a shit. So no, um, I just would rather pick the right exercises. But yeah, like- there's a lot of built-in redundancy as well with the same there, exercises. Oh God, yes. I mean, look at the average person's chest workout. It's like, all right, barbell bench, machine bench, dumbbell bench. Okay, those are all the same movements. Then it's like incline bench, incline barbell, incline machine. Like those are all the same movement. At least do a compound and a stretch or a compound and a contract. That's where positions of flexion, which was an Iron Man thing. His argument, uh, Hoffman. Uh, yeah, Holman, Steve, Steve, Holman. Holman. Steve Holman. Yeah. Holman. yeah. Hoffman was the other guy. Was that you <laughs> needed to train a muscle in three different positions, which was where tension is highest in the mid range. And that's typically your big compounds. One exercise where tension was highest in the stretch position. And it's interesting that partial, you know, length and partials and stretch mediated hypertrophy are all the rage right now. You need to do one where the muscle, there was peak contraction. So like for chest, you'd be looking like barbell bench is your mid range, right? Because the, the hardest bit is right there in the middle, right? You've got flies, stretch position, and you've got a pec deck or a crossover, which is your contracted position. Quads was like squatter leg press, which is mid range, leg extension, which is peak contraction, and then like sissy squats for um for stretch things of that nature. And it's like, yeah, with the specialization phase, you know, rather than just doing like the one or two exercises per muscle group, eh, split your eight sets per workout or ten sets per workout, do four of a compound to a piece of, you know, stretch in a mid range, and I think people would be very surprised. Um rather than just doing the same movement over and over and over again, which I just like, why are you doing hack squat, leg press, pendulum squat? It is all the same fundamental movement pattern. Do something different. Well, unless, because again, this gets into global issues and we don't have time enough to talk about this, but like one thing you do see the, the debates or the questions, this came up in my group and I wrote this big ass ranty piece about it. One of the pieces of confusion about fitness, among everything else, so many things seem to work. And some of that is just genetics. Some of that is, or there's lots of reasons for that. But people start to get fixated on the details and they forget the fundamentals. And the fundamentals, when you look at it, when you look at all time-tested programs, all effective programs, the fundamentals are always the same. The details may differ. So one, the one that, that I'm thinking of right now, uh, Chris Bumstead, who I think has retired now. I think he got out of it because he's still, go, still going. Is he? But I know didn't he talk about like he like cut his doses by like tenfold? Isn't he? Like didn't he cut his doses way back for health reasons? Or he, he's got a health problem. Um, I know he's got a baby on the way as well, so he's probably kind of conflicted with where he puts his priorities. Okay, but I think he still probably, I probably he probably wants to equal Arnold's. Fair uh, enough. Olympia wins. Yeah. But so someone in my group was like, oh, I read this article and he says he likes to do two sets of four exercises per muscle group. Why? Rather than four sets of two exercises. And I'm like, who cares? It's still eight sets per muscle group. Who gives a shit? It's personal preference. It's individual. Maybe that's the machines he's got. Maybe he gets bored doing the same thing over and over and over again. One guy I've talked, you know, talked to and he's like, I like I've got all these different machines in my gym. I like playing on new stuff because it keeps me mentally excited. Like big picture stuff. Does it really matter? Like one of Duchesne's unique or ideas, and I don't know that, I don't think anyone really pursued this. He made the point that most of the people that were becoming bodybuilding coaches were strength coaches, like Charles Poliquin, like guys like that. They came from the performance background. And Duchenne was like, a lot of what they are focused on is nervous system optimization. Now, Duchenne, trust me, dude was brilliant. Drugs, amazing. Nutrition, pretty good. His training stuff, eh. 
uh, there were a lot of places I could poke holes in it. And he's like, and he, but he was at, but he just asked good questions. He says, rather than doing four sets of an exercise where some of those, some of the adaptations to that may be neural, would growth maybe be better if you did one, set, one hard set of eight different exercises, like the same volume, but changing up the neuromuscular pattern, changing up would that, and it was just more of him just like speculating more than anything, but it's an interesting thought. And I mean, again, I can't think of eight chest exercises that are worth a damn. Um, and well, okay, that's not true. The example we were using of the average person's chest workout. All right, four sets flat bench, four sets chest press, four sets dumbbell bench. Okay, those are all the same movement. You just did 12 sets of the same exercise. Now, if someone was like two sets barbell bench, you know, one set of machine chest press for whatever reason, one set of dumbbells. Okay, that I got no problem with, right? If you're talking about doing like, you know, four sets across three different exercises for reasons, whatever they may, you know, whatever they may be, that's a very different sort of situation. We're talking about, you know, as far as, so anyway, so that was Dan's idea. It was like, all right, that's, I thought that was interesting um, in, in that sense. I think we speak on that body contract program yeah, here for a while. that was, was unique um i knew one or two people that tried it and it just wasn't practically i useful. tried it yeah because you needed two partners to do the eccentrics like that was yeah, the the yeah. really interesting idea one thing i wanted to go back to back to the volume thing this is one of the, the amusing contradictions i find in the fitness industry that doesn't seem to see these uh and it goes to the failure issue it goes to the volume issue it goes to what i think we'll make a lot of these arguments go away and we'll touch on that and then we'll move forward is a lot of these people that are into volume, they'll, they'll cite these papers that are like, Oh, training to failure causes excessive neuromuscular fatigue. And this is true in studies that use like, they compare like three sets of 10 to failure to six sets of five. Well, yeah, I agree with you. Three hard sets is more fatiguing than six warm up sets. I will not debate that point. I don't see how this is relevant to normal training where people are, because they then say, you know, you need to be at two to three reps in reserve, two to three reps from a failure. Well, then how is a set at 50% of maximal reps relevant to this? But in the same breath, they will look at these set, these Brad's study that was supposedly 45 sets per week to failure. So what you're telling me is, Three sets of 10 to failure is too fatiguing but for, in one workout, but 45 sets for eight straight weeks. Somehow 360 sets to failure is fine. I'm still waiting for an explanation of that. Not to mention, how is comparing even three sets of 10 to failure to three sets of 10 not to failure? This is not how people train in the real world. Is someone truly going to tell me that three sets of 10 to failure is more neuromuscular fatiguing? than 26 fucking sets for quads. You're really, really going to tell me that that workout is too much, but 52 sets of quads a week, sure. And I ask these questions, and they're like, fuck you, Lyle, and they block me. Like, I don't, I, I'm curious why this seeming contradiction is not being addressed. Neither here nor there, that's just the nature of the industry. One of the questions that I asked Mike Isertal, and I even paid to ask for it one time and still never got an answer. I've asked it many, many times. None of the RP crew have ever gotten back to me. <laughs> because his, his template show, week one, you start off minimal volume and a very low yeah. uh, reps in reserve. So, uh, you know, so I'm very, it's not anywhere near the failure. As you progress through the weeks, the sets increase exponentially sometimes. Yeah. And by, say, week six, you're doing six sets of squats to failure with another leg press, six sets of leg press to failure. And I said, there's supposed to be like an inverse relationship between intensity and volume. What's going on here? And no one's ever gotten back to me of why it's structured like that. Yeah. Well, that's the other one that is also interesting to me is that this basic, this fundamental principle of training, which is frequency, intensity, time, or volume, and type of exercise, seems to have been forgotten. So like, oh, three by 10 to failure is bad. Well, don't we need to keep that within context? Especially when that, those studies are like, it causes excessive neuromuscular fatigue at 48 hours. Most bodybuilders train a muscle group once a week. Why the fuck does this matter? Even twice a week. Why does this matter? They tested squat and bench press. 
Is this the same as for curls? Is it different for pushdowns? Like to draw these really global conclusions from this very, and, and the, the only study I'm aware of, a guy in my group was on it, compared five sets to failure. And don't, anyone listening to this, I'm not saying you should train to failure. I'm asking questions about what the industry is saying about this stuff, because they seem to be contradicting themselves right, left, and center. Five sets to failure versus four sets, two reps shorter than one set to failure. That to me is a much more real world comparison. And they found, unfortunately, they didn't use the right measure of neuromuscular fatigue, but muscle damage is the same in both. And I'm like, I have a feeling that in that similar, but again, that's not normal. That's not a regular comparison. Show me three sets of 10 to failure versus 10 sets of two reps in reserve. The types of workouts that you would actually be doing or recommending. Because until I see that, and I'm not saying it will or won't be, saying until you do that comparison, saying that failure is bad without ignoring these other variables is kind of simplistic and seems to be ignoring some major, major issues, which goes into, and again, I'll try to address this quickly because I think part of my approach, I try to build models because to me, you have to look at all the data, right? When you build a good scientific model, you need to look at all the data. And for you, when you do that, you're like, all right, this says this, and this says the other. Now, it's very easy to go, well, I don't like that because I don't, I like this. And make no mistake, sometimes the studies are just crap, but regardless, you, go, you look at them all in, in, in total and go, okay, are there any systematic differences between why this group of studies is showing one thing and this group of studies are showing a different thing? Because maybe there's a fundamental basis of that. Now, as an example, we know that metabolic slowdown is frequently not seen in individuals who are very overweight, right? There's been this decades long argument about metabolic adaptation and half the studies are like, we don't see it. Half the studies are, we do see it. And you look at it and go, well, in the studies that don't, they're always above a certain body fat percentage or leptin's above a certain level and the system's saturated. And then when you get below that level, suddenly the adaptations start. And then here's a study I found where it started with none and then as their leptin dropped below a certain level, it started to occur. Boom, now I have a model that can explain all the data. That's part of my goal. So then I start looking at all the volume studies. Now, number one, most of them do support the moderate volumes, almost without fail. And another video about three or four weeks ago that looked at that that said, you know, it's, they were kind of, they were very political about it because scientists have to be and I don't. And they were like, so, it seems to be the case that the studies that don't support the volume model tend to be held to different standards of criticism than the ones that do. I'm like, mm, yeah, funny. I mean, we all do it, neither here nor there. It's like, not to mention that at least one of the major studies on volume saw growth that literally no other lab has gotten. So maybe there's more, maybe we need to ask why. But regardless of that, how, how can we, well, what I think is the issue is that we're looking at the wrong thing. Speaking about sets and reps in isolation is totally meaningless, right? 10 sets of 10 fucking about may be less of a stimulus than three sets of 10. It's a failure. Sets of the reps don't necessarily tell us anything. I mean, good example, since Mike Isertel's name just came up, the study that, that Cody Hahn did with the volume study. They did repeat sets of 10, four reps from failure. And the way the workout was structured, there was 10 minutes in between work sets because they did this weird cyclical thing. So I'm like, and they worked up from what was it? 10 to 32 sets and they saw no net growth and what little growth they did supposedly see was water and, and sarco sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. And it's like, well, yeah, 32 sets of warmups a week don't, tend to generate growth. Uh, I would not disagree with that. There wasn't even cumulative fatigue. But you start to look at this and you're like, okay, how can we explain all these different seemingly disparate pieces of data? Maybe that brings us into sort of the effective reps model, which I know is still, you know, it's being debated and it may or may not be true. I suspect it will be closer true to not, as I did a, another podcast a couple weeks ago. Because there's this new paper 
saying that you can grow five to eight at five to eight reps in reserve. Like, bullshit. So you're telling me that if I do sets of two at a 10 rep max, that'll stimulate growth? Bullshit. No, I don't believe it for a second. I don't care what the data says. I don't. Five is even on the edge. But regardless, the effective reps model basically says that growth, that the stimulus to growth is doing repetitions under full mu full muscular activation, full muscular recruitment. And actually, Borge Fagerly, like, he was the first one talking about this way, way, way back in the 2000s. And it's just become sort of a, a new thing now. I think Chris Beardsley is the big proponent of it. So the idea is that in any given set, you will get a certain number of effective reps. And that is really the big driver on growth. Because we know, and again, I've been saying this for 30 years, the primary driver on hypertrophy is mechanical tension. It's this weird system. Muscle fibers contract, high mechanical tension. They pull on this structure called focal, uh, uh, focal adhesion kinase, which causes this whole uh, biochemical pathway. It's how a mechanical stimulus can be translated into a biochemical stimulus. And it took them years to figure this out. So that's the effective reps model. Now, some people argue against this, but the point I made in this other podcast was if you do not recruit a muscle fiber, it cannot grow. This seems to be a fairly non-controversial statement. If you do not recruit a muscle fiber, it cannot grow. And yet somehow. So the idea here is that there may be a maximum number of effective reps per workout, or an optimal number, that gives you the maximum growth. And to me, that's the question we need to be answering. I don't give a shit about sets and reps and volumes and frequencies. Just do an acute study and find out how many maximal repetitions or how many maximal set give increases muscle protein synthesis at the what threshold, right? Just, I, I get it, you know, do get, get some people and do the stuff. Three sets, six sets, nine, 12, 15, 18. Muscle protein synthesis is going to do something and then flat, just, I don't care about all these other variables, which is the problem with these studies. They're like, well, we did sets of 8 to 10 on 90 seconds, and we did sets of 12 on 60 seconds, and we did different exercises. Like, you can't, you're, you're trying to throw different colors of paint into a tub, and it all looks gray, right? And you conclude it's all gray. But, so let's say that, like, you've got, let's, let's just say 25 effective reps per workout. I think Beardsley... Somewhere he said 25 to 30. I read that piece a dozen times. I got no clue how he came up with that. No one's been able to explain it to me, but it doesn't matter. There has to be a maximum stimulus above which there is no further growth. That is how mechanosensors work. We don't know what it is yet. Neither here nor there. Let's say it's 25 for the sake of argument. And I think there's indirect data that points to this being true, but without in terms of with heavy sets, you don't have to go to failure because you start with more uh, effective reps. And with the low load stuff, you do have to go to failure because that's the only way to get to full recruitment. But whatever. Okay, so on a maximal set of five to eight, you're going to get about five effective reps. Four to five, somewhere in that range. So you would need, say, five to six sets. Or actually even, well, I'll go forward and go backwards. All right, let's say you're now training at two reps in reserve, right? So you're going to do a set of eight at a 10 rep max. So now you're getting three effective reps. Well, you're going to get about eight to 10 sets per workout. Now let's say you're going to train at four reps in reserve and you're going to faff about the short rest intervals. Well, you're going to need about 50% more sets. So you're going to need about 15 sets per workout. Boom. All the contradictions disappear. Or go back and look at like dog crap or rest pause, right? You look at dog crap training, which is you do an all out active, all out set to failure, rest however long, do a mini set, do a mini set, right? So figure that all out set to failure, that's five effective reps. Mini set, you get three more, four more, that's nine, you get three more, and that's 12. He does two exercises per muscle group, boom, 24 effective reps. You look at my reps by Borge Fagerly. Similar, but not quite the same. It's right in that range. And to me, all of a sudden, you've got a model that can explain every different study. And if they would stop looking at 
total sets and total reps and total volumes and fucking volume load, which who uses tonnage in the modern era? That was a 1970s Russian thing and it didn't work then either. Um, all of a sudden to me, you can see why so many different systems of training seem to work. Like, yeah, if you want to do four all out sets, you're going to get about 20 effective reps. If you want to do 10 sets, a couple reps short of failure, same thing. If you want to fuck about and do 15 piss ass sets or work on a short rest interval, same thing. Or you can do dog crap and suffer. And it all ends up kind of, to me, if you count it out that way, then you get into the issue of like counting smaller muscle groups versus larger muscle groups, which was a big point I made early on because people forgot about Brad's study. All right, it was quads was squat, leg press, leg extension. So two, and then it was chest. The three chest movements were compounds and the three back movements were compounds. But then they measured bicep and tricep. Okay, you didn't do 45 sets for biceps and triceps. You did 45 sets for bicep for chest and back. We assume about one half to one ratio. Well, what you really did was 22 sets for biceps and triceps in the highest group. Suddenly that 27 set group, which is what actually got the best growth, it's about 13 sets per week. Hmm. And then the nine set per week, they only did four, four and a half sets. Yeah, I'm not surprised they didn't get as good growth because they're out of the supposed weekly optimal range. When you actually mash it out rationally, it all starts to kind of, everything starts to come together. Now there's another interesting note. After I made that point, um, at the risk of sounding even more ego-driven than I am, Red's written a few papers that I swear to God were written simply so he could say Lyle was wrong. I shit you not, I've read a couple that are like, this is like a direct response to something I said. Because he wrote one that talked about how to count reps during workouts, how to count volume. And in that his retail makes videos through the same lens oh. to try to say Lyle's wrong. Oh no, absolutely. It's got nothing to do other than Lyle that just Lyle's wrong. But they won't ever actually directly rebut my questions. So he writes this paper. And he's basically like, makes all these arguments about this stuff. And at the end of it, essentially says, even though we know it's wrong to count them one to one, we should still do that because that's how it's always been done. And that I find a particularly dumb argument. Then you read Max Muscle 2.0 and he says, when you're looking at smaller muscle groups, you should count them about one half to one per volume. Because... They think the rules are different online versus in the, in the research. But when you, again, without getting into all of that, it is basically, I, I, I also just, again, randomly, I don't want to turn it into a bright fest, but I find it so funny that so many people in this industry are A, so super butthurt over me, but they're like, man, Lyle sucks, and Lyle ain't shit, he's nothing. And I'm like, well, then why don't you have anything better to do than talk about me? If my opinion is really that worthless, just ignore it. If you really, if I've got nothing to say, why do you feel the incessant need to try to defend yourself against me? Because deep down, you know I'm right. But anyway, so yeah, so like, when you start to look at volumes rationally, to me, all of the discrepancies between the research, even between practical programming, in terms of what works, seems to disappear. I mean, you could probably even look at you know, look at Arnold, like, well, look at Dorian. We, we talked about figure he did four all-out sets to failure per muscle group on average. Well, that's about 20 effective reps, somewhere in that range. He did seven exercises for back alone. Are you sure about that? When I looked, it was only like I, three. I, um, I counted it up as well because Justin Harris came onto my podcast and said, if you look at Dorian's training, he did seven exercises for back. So I made a little uh, reel up for him and I actually put the seven exercises in, in sequence including rear delts, if you want to call, call that back in track as well. Yeah, well, it's weird. I've seen di I've seen different workouts for him. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Barbell row, hammer strength pull down, another barbell row. That doesn't seem right. Oh, that's a warm-up. Yeah. Cable row. I mean, I guess if you're counting some of the rear delt work. He did yeah, deadlifts. He, got... he did shrugs. He did uh, rear delt raises. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I tend to – I don't know if I'd count those as back. I count – I mean, shrugs – 
but it, it's neither here nor there. Chest is like four exercises, typically quads is like four exercises. But even so, you're looking at, you know, 28 to 35 effective reps once a week. Then you go look at, you know, Arnold and their ilk when they were doing 20 sets. They weren't grinding to failure, but they weren't, they weren't pissing about either. Like you watch their work sets. They usually went till at least, you know, it slowed down a little bit. So they were probably, you know, at what we would now call, what, two to three reps in reserve. And they did a little bit more volume. And, you know, it all, to a great degree, it all sort of comes out in the wash. And even beyond that, I would say, you know, and this is the other issue I have with this whole thing is it's still missing the big point, right? Is that all these systems, no matter what they're based around, whether you're doing volume or intensity or frequency and the other in the short term, which is what all these studies are. They're like, all right, well, over eight to 10 weeks, this is what happened. Well, great. What about the rest of the year? What about your entire career? Because frequently what you can get away with or even should do over the short term is a very different thing. Because at the end of the day, and this is the other big uh, disagreement I have, and don't worry, it'll, it'll, it's already starting to come back around. Somewhere along the way, mainly because of Brad and, and some of the, those folks, the idea that volume is the primary driver on hyper recovery. And bottom line, it's not. It's not. Does volume play a role? Absolutely. Um, is volume load, and it's a measure of something. I don't know what, I don't know if I buy that exactly. But where this came from was some of these volume studies where, okay, if we increase volume, up to a point, you get more hypertrophy. But here's the problem I have with that. And this is the video I made. I talked about it today, and I think I thought last week, when I talked about powerlifters versus bodybuilders. If you actually read the studies and read the methods and read what's done, with three exceptions I'm aware of, one study by Mike, one that Brad did that I haven't, where they increased reps instead of weight, and then another one where they just used some weird weekly frequency, very just different different types of training each workout. You actually read the methods. Every study says to keep the lifters within the proper repetition range, we added weight to the bar. Without exception. Because apparently lab coats know more than fitness professionals. Lab coats, right? If, if there's not progressive overload, there's not progressive tension overload, it's not training. You are not adding weight to the bar over time, and this is key. I'm not saying every week, I'm not saying every workout, I'm not saying how often, like over time, you're not getting bigger. And the whole issue on volume and frequencies and length and partials and all of this to me is very much obscuring that point, which is that all of that's interesting and all of that may be part of the picture acutely. But the bottom line is if you are not adding weight to the bar over time, you are not getting any bigger as a natural. And that's really where Dante Trudell, when he came in in the 2000s, and I've been saying that forever, like my generic bulking routine is based around, you know, adding weight when you can over and trying to hit small PRs every eight weeks and then doing it again and again. Because if you look at all big natural bodybuilders are strong. Right now they're not, people go, but they're, they're not powerlifters strong and they don't do the low reps. Like they're not practicing 1RM training, but a lot of them do cross compete in powerlifting. And that's kind of telling because, and it's not, people get confused when I say this. They go, but the, the strongest guy is not the biggest. I said, well, I didn't say they were. What I said was, for a given individual, getting stronger over time will make them bigger. Not comparing them to anybody else. Although, generally speaking, the guy with the biggest 1RM is usually the biggest guy. Like, within, there's a pretty good relationship. But you're not comparing people because there's biomechanics. Like, but if I take someone, and right now they can squat 135 by 8, you know, 60 kilos. And four years from now, they can squat 100, uh, 180 kilos for 8. They will be bigger. Their legs will be bigger because they have to be. There's no way they can't be. Now, well, can I say... They'll be linearly bigger by no, I, I can't. But flat out, as a natural, if you're not getting stronger in a month, and that's again, Dante came in the 2000. Where everybody was doing the squeeze and the pump and weight on the bar doesn't matter and all that other stuff. And he said, 
got people. His thing was you got to beat the got to beat the logbook. He got people. He convinced them that the goal, and he simplistically said, hypertrophy is caused by growing stronger in a moderate repetition range. And that sums it up. Like that right there. Everything else is by definition secondary. So every one of these studies, it's like progressive tension overload is built in. They are studying volumes, frequencies, rest intervals, whatever, 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 on top of the one thing that's really important. By definition, this is primary. Because if it's not there, it ain't training. Everything else is secondary by definition. And Stuart McRobert was even saying it before Dante, because he was saying back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, when you can bench three, squat four, and deadlift five, you're going to be a considerably sure. bigger human being than when you started. I mean, hell, Arthur Jones said famously, because by the time you can barbell curl 225 by eight, your arms will be big enough for anything short of wrestling a bear or something roughly to that effect. And just to the point about volume, I found that obviously, you know, you're trying to add a progressive overload over time. So I've always been a Dante dog crap advocate as well. But psychologically, it burns you out after a while and you do hit a sticking point. And at that point, I found out if I implemented lighter volume-based training with a lower RIR, then I can at least maybe psychologically, but also the look of my muscle because I'm doing more volume Absolutely. For some reason it looks different. And then I go back to the Dante stuff and then I progress more again. So yes. it's kind of like that yeah. accumulation yeah. and intensification that Poliquin talked about. And I think there absolutely is something to that, right? Because you'll hear people go, oh, you know, I burnt out or I, I've sort of plateaued on one style of training. And then they always jump to the opposite extreme. They go from volume to HIT or vice versa and seem to start making progress again. I think there's a, probably a few things involved with that. One is there's a psychological component. Dog crap did burn a lot of people out, right? And again, I want to really emphasize because people love to, uh, I'll say misrepresent, but in one case, boldface lie about it. They'll go, oh, Lyle just advocates training to failure. No, I don't. And I never have. Hilariously, I, if you go look at what most people recommend, I recommend training to failure way less than most of this industry. They'll be like, oh, you know, take the final set of each exercise to failure. I've never recommended that. I love powerlifting routines that are like every workout, do an AMRAP squat set, as many reps as possible. Like, if you get your fucking mind, A, none of you have ever done an actual as many reps as you can. <laughs> and on deadlifts, sure. And I'm like, eh, failure has its place. Depends on how you want to train. But people are like, oh, what? Mike, that's what I actually, you know what? That's why I checked out of the industry. Mike Isertel said on the Lifting Dermatologist podcast, Lyle McDonald advocates training to failure for all people under all circumstances, which is a bold-faced fucking lie, or he's an illiterate moron. Your no archives one... in the early 2000s are easily accessible, and they don't say any, anything of the kind. Even the videos I did talk, I was just like, this is what failure is. I said half a dozen times, I'm not saying you should train to failure. But when he did that, and nobody cared, I go, people are still bitching about shit I said a decade ago. And they're like, oh, Mike's going to just flat out lie. I was like, fuck all of y'all. That's when I was done for two years. Because why? Why would I bother? And people defended him. Well, maybe he misunderstood. Well, if you're going to argue that, if you're going to say that maybe Mike misunderstood, there's one of two possibilities. Either, well, that he said that. Either he's an absolute cretin who can't understand simple words, or he's a bold-faced liar. There are no other options. Regardless, I don't, so I'm not saying train to failure. Dog crap worked really well for a lot of people, but it also burned a lot of people out because going to failure all the time does. Going to your question, which is far more interesting than the tragedy of this industry, one of my long-term speculations, well, even before I get to that, we do have that whole issue about myofibrillar, the actual muscle fibers versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, the pump growth. And it's been interesting to me watching that come in and out of favor. Right, you go back and like Vladimir Zatskiorsky wrote about that in his book years ago. Truly a turgid tome. If you've ever had the misfortune to read that, um, doesn't say very much. But and I had and there was always an empirical belief, an anecdotal belief. They're like guys who train a certain way look different. Right, a lot of that came out to like the East Coast bodybuilders in America were heavy, high intensity, and they had this dense, grainy look. And the West Coast bodybuilders were all pumpers and fluffers, and they just looked kind of puffy. And if they didn't train for a while, they would shrink. And 
Then that was a thing, and I'd written about that. And then in the 2000s, Brian Haycock, as I recall, presented data going, well, actually, when you train, both bits grow at the same time. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy kind of fell out as a belief. Then it came back. And it came back about the time that the, the Cody Hahn paper, the volume paper that Mike Isertel was on, came out. Because when they went back and reanalyzed it, then that all that submaximal volume did, in fact, predominantly cause sarcoplasmic growth. And they wrote a big paper about this. And they looked at, again, all the data in the aggregate and what had happened. The data that Brian Haycock was looking at, showing that both fractions grow at the same time, is all in beginners. Where training does tend to stimulate everything. And then we look at it in a more advanced trainees, some directly, some indir indirectly, you find that, well, yeah, it does absolutely happen. You can actually see a change in the ratios of the actual myofibers, the actual muscle fibers, and the sarcoplasm, all the fluid that's around it. So I do think some of what is happening in that sense, what you're describing, is absolutely that. I think when you're doing that lower volume, higher intensity, very high tension training, that is really stimulating more myofibrillar growth. The volume is just not there to, to stress the sarcoplasmic tissues, the energetic tissues. That was something Poliquin wrote about way back when, because his training advice was really good stuff. But some of his later stuff, meh, maybe not, regardless of that. And he talked about that, and he was like, look, he's like, somebody comes to me and they go, I got eight weeks to get as big as possible. It's like, first two weeks, we're going to do big volume things. We want to stress glycogen storage, mitochondria, the sarcoplasm to get that fluid increase, get that, that pump growth. I mean, it's a thing. There's been studies that it's really, they're hilarious. They're like, they give them really silly names and they're like, you know, sarco, lacto pump growth. It's just these weird, and they're like, it'll be like seven sets of 10 on 60 seconds and shit like that. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. There is an acute effect. But I do think stressing those systems differently may be causing some differential adaptations, right? And one of the ideas that I think Zatsky Ursi talked about, like, all right, so you've got a muscle and you've got the sarcoplasm and you've got, you know, the fibers that are chopped. So you train and the fibers get bigger and they may reach a point where they're limited, limited by the sarcoplasmic volume. Well, then you do a pump block and give a little bit more room and then you bring up the myofibrils and I, so one of my long-term speculations, and this is purely until I figure out ribosomal training systems, which is me partially being silly, but not really. We know that there are different parts to muscle growth. There are different systems involved. Because one really interesting question, maybe you have some thoughts on this, is like, why does growth seem to be sporadic, right? You train and train and train, and nothing, 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 and then, boom, you're bigger. Why? And I don't have an answer for it, truly. I Again, I've thought about, is it fitness fatigue? I've thought about it a lot of different, but what I think may be happening, we know that there's a bunch of different adaptations that have to occur for the, in the whole system. And I wonder if it's just like, all right, until they kind of all catch up, and here we're talking about capillary density, myofibril, muscle protein synthesis, whatever's going on with like protein stability and mRNA and ribosomes and mitochondria and all that stuff that I'll have to maybe sort of, maybe it's not until they all adapt to the same place that you get to this. I don't know. Maybe it's just that we don't have the ability to measure it accurately because growth is so depressingly small, right? I mean, if you're gaining a kilo a month all over your body, you know, what's that? <laughs> Me, even, holy crap, if you look at these studies, the, the growth they get over 12 weeks, it's measured in centimeters or millimeters. Yeah. It's like the difference is like the thickness of your fingernail in growth. It's like, yeah, that's worth doing 52 sets. Uh, and for the growth to occur beyond the intermediate and the advanced stage, you're basically, like you said, the universe okay. has to align. That systemic recovery has to be there. All yes. the components need to be working in your favor just for that little microgram of muscle to appear, so. Basically, yeah. And so what I've wondered for a while is, 
more at the advanced level, because like in the beginning, everything kind of comes up evenly, is, is a block to growth. Is it possible that it's there? It's whatever, I mean, it's whatever the limiting system is, right? Like, is it possible that like, we know that when a muscle gets bigger, capillary density goes down, right? The number of capillaries doesn't decrease, but the relative capillary density goes down because the fiber gets bigger. Is it possible that that is decreasing blood and nutrient flow to the muscles to a degree that that is now the rate limiting step in our ability to grow? We know there's some really interesting data you know, on the hyper responders that after a training session, right, people who make more ribosomes, which for those who remember high school chemistry is what takes mRNA and turns it into proteins, people who upregulate ribosomes better grow faster. And the hyper responder stuff is really interesting because they're finding that a given individual, well, between any two given individuals, growth may differ tenfold. So what a lot of the studies have done now is they'll make people their own control. They're like, all right, right arm, one workout, left arm, a different workout. And they compare and what they find is that hyper responders grow well for whatever they do. And hypo responders, you might as well go play ping pong, pick a better sport because you're going to suck at this and there's nothing you're ever going to do about it. And the hyper responders will respond better to either type of training than and what I think is possibly happening in these studies, whether deliberately or not, if you're comparing 10 people that did 45 sets and 10 people that did 27, because the variation is fucking enormous, right? The data is always like this and overlapping, and you see like one freak show outlier pulls the average up, and they go, see, see, better average growth. I'm like, yeah, but three of the guys in the highest volume group grew less than six of the guys in the 27 set group. Like the, the, the averages don't matter. It's possible that like if by hook or by crook, you end up with more hyper responders in a given group, that group will look superior, but not because of the training. So that's why a lot of these studies think they're using. But anyway, so we know that. We know that people that have better mitochondrial function get better growth, probably because they have more energetic capacity to synthesize proteins. People who upregulate the androgen receptor more effectively get better growth. These are the people that, these are your, your easy gangers. But it makes me then wonder, like, okay, I mean, it'd be great. Hopefully there will be a time eventually where we can determine for one, any given person, what their personal or might be nervous system. And I do, I want to go back to Scott Abel briefly because that ties in with all of us. Okay, let's say you're, you've got a lagging body part for whatever reason. like. For whatever reason, let's say maybe it's a mitochondrial function in that one muscle group, would doing high rep short rest interval training to stress the energetic pathways or even aerobic training, would that facilitate growth in a more classic hypertrophy zone? Right? I did a video last week where I talked about the fact that I've long recommended short maximal strength cycles, short, like three weeks for bodybuilders, ever just maybe two times a year, right? Because as your muscle gets bigger, your nervous system function may not be keeping up with that, right? Powerlifters who do a lot of low reps really optimize nervous system function. Bodybuilders who don't tend to be more muscular. Nervous system is always involved. And sometimes topping that up a little bit with just three weeks of you know heavy triples and fives. When you go back to the higher volume work, or the higher repetition ranges, you can lift much heavier weights, which means more, more candidate, more growth. But I wonder if we couldn't even expand that. Okay, maybe take the UD2 system, which right, you've got the two depletion workouts, high reps on a short rest interval, you've got the tension workouts, your kind of classical hypertrophy range, and then your heavy stuff, the power workouts of fives. Rather than doing it in a week, what if you're like, okay, I'm a little bit burnt, I'm gonna do two weeks high rep short rest interval training try to get some energetic pathways, maybe some enzymes, who knows, capillaries, whatever. You know, Perillo used to do high rep sets for exactly that reason. He said it's to build capillaries. Now, did it? Maybe, maybe not. But he, I don't think he was drilling a dry well. So you do well, too much. If nothing else, it gives your joints a break. It gives your nervous system a break. It lets everything get healthy again because going heavy all the time, you end up injured. 
And then you do, you know, six to eight weeks of classical hypertrophy training or eight to 12 or two cycles or whatever, however you do it. And then you do, you know, maybe that is working on some pathway or maybe some more volume, get maybe some sarcoplasmic growth to build off the, the high rep stuff. Then you do some, you know, lower volume, higher intensity stuff, build a little bit more density and then finish up with a little maximal strength. Do it again. It's totally, it's a totally hypothetical cycle, but I suspect if you were to look at how you vary your training, I mean, most people do it by accident. Like I'm bored of volume. I'm going to do mensur, and then they start growing and they grow for a couple of months and then they get bored of that and they go back to something else. What have you found? Exactly that. And I think it also underscores the true beauty of the UD2.0 UD <laughs> system, because even if you neglected the diet part of it and just ran that undulating weekly right. uh, setup, I think you would be miles ahead of the game very quickly. They might all lead in the same place eventually, right? but you're getting the best of all worlds, basically. Issue I have with that, because I do think it's funny. I'm like, yep, I was talking about daily undulating periodization way before it was cool, because that sort of came later in the periodization literature. I do find that it is difficult to implement because you have to do those weird full body workouts, which a lot of people don't like. Like that's the problem with trying to, because people forget that a lot of the periodization literature, that's like the bodybuilding stuff. They don't, they don't care about bodybuilders. They care about athletes who are actually doing sports performance and who frequently have to optimize or at least develop a number of different capacities at the same time. But their life is not the weight room, right? For a, a team sport athlete, soccer, basketball, whatever, they are not trying to maximize maximal strength. They are not trying to maximize hypertrophy. They are not trying to, they're trying to develop a bunch of different things. And they only have limited time. They've got like three hours a week to be in the weight room. And what, what people found early on with the linear periodization schemes is like, all right, you do your 15s for muscular endurance and your eights for hypertrophy and then your five is that when you're doing the fives, you detrain the top end. So they're like, well, we'll just have one day of each and we'll have a power day and endurance day and a hypertrophy day. And that works great under those conditions. But for bodybuilding, when you're looking at higher volumes, it becomes very impractical. I think heavy light is probably the better way to do it, to have like yeah. heavy tension. If you look at my generic bulking routine, it has both. You do heavy tension work and you do metabolic work. And then as you get stronger, you do all your tension work on one day and all your metabolic work on the other, because otherwise you run your joints into phase. So I do think and you recently proposed a, an underrated split where people do upper, lower, and then they do a full body. Because yeah. I think people under undervalue full bodies because you've got to remember that pre-steroid, everyone mm -hmm. was doing full bodies. Yes. So that was just hard and hustle. Yeah, no, and I think, I mean, I think if you look back, a lot of the split routine stuff came from Arnold and that that's when all that really started. I've got yeah, well, the I, magazines because they needed articles to say here's how Arnold trains his arms, here's how he trains his there's much more content back that by doing it that way. Right. And and there were so there were all these new exercises. And because a lot of people forget, you know, if you look back at the classical training in the early 20th century and this whole marriage to you know the big five and squat and bench and over and deadlifts, the reason they did that is because that's all there was to do. Machines did not exist as we know them today. Right. I mean, they tried. They were trying this funny thing called the Tomb of Hercules. It's a, there's a, a drawing you can find, and it's a it's a piece of wood on a rope. From the there's a wall here, and they put plates on it, and there's a guy laying on his back, leg pressing. Like they were trying, but there just wasn't. So they didn't have that many options. And then once we got into you know Gold's Gym and Nautilus, or Nautilus in the early machine days, suddenly they had a billion different exercises they could do. It just wasn't around before that. And you look at it. God, I found this article years ago, and they asked like the 1952 Mr. Universe champions what they did, and it's the most basic stuff. But if you look at natural bodybuilders back then, they're not meaningfully smaller than mo I mean, they're just not. They're not as conditioned. They're not as lean. But they they did like nine to seventeen sets per week in a moderate repetition range. They added weight anywhere from as often as they could to every two weeks. Right? It was really basic stuff, and then. We got into all this, but yeah, the upper lower full body, which is something I've, I've championed for a long time for people that only have three days a week. It is kind of the best of both worlds. You can do a little bit more volume on the split days and you can do the one full body workout, which is a little bit quicker. 
you can pick, you know, gives you a little more exercise variety on the first two days. Just go in and hit, you know, the primary stuff for two or three sets. And it allows you to use two different repetition ranges. You can do, you know, do a heavy light or whatever. Yeah. But the reality is that most people won't do it. Um, I remember when hypertrophy specific training was the thing. Brian Haycock and I were, oh, you know, we were of this it. era. Um, I don't think I ever did it in its strictest sense, but I know it had a big following. And his book is due out any day now. It's only been 20 years. It's the only person who's a slower writer than I am. But I remember talking with about him and I go, dude, regardless of how good or bad this is, I go, the, the masses are not going to buy into it, which is another big part of all of this. You have to believe in the training because if you don't, it doesn't matter how perfect it is, flat out. But I go, I go, dude, this one has two major problems that I see. Number one, people don't like full body workouts. This is before full body really made that in the late 2000s with starting strength and all that when that really became the thing to do again. And I go, and number two, people aren't going to do submaximal workouts five times out of six. I go, psychologically, the average lifter is simply not going to do that. Right or wrong, you do have to take that into account. Right? With my generic bulking routine, two weeks. Like any more than that, the average person is going to check out before they start working hard. So, um, so yeah, so like, well, yeah, you look with all of that full body, I think you run into problems. Well, but then again, most people do too many redundant exercises. The average person would probably be better off either doing, you know, three exercises for a couple of sets, three times a week. You know, you look back at that Nautilus Bolton one, that's pretty much what it was. You know, the famous leg extension, leg press squat, triple, you know, tricep. Um, yeah, you go through that once in a workout you're not going to need a whole lot more um, you look like casey beato in 30 days yeah right the famous <laughs> the famous the colorado experiment i loved watching people argue about that for the longest time um so yeah so i think you know to me when you look at this all globally in terms of different systems of hypertrophy it all kind of the fundamentals are always there but I, I think, yeah, I, going back to what we were talking about as far as working potentially different systems, I think there is some logic to that. Just, I mean, and this is one of the, I look at it coming from also, you know, performance standpoint. There are different components that go into athletic performance. Just doing the one thing doesn't bring them all up at once, right? There's a reason that track sprinters, right, you do starts you do speed work, you do acceleration work, you do endurance work. I've heard it referred to as uh, training at the edges or training at the front. So you do all that and then you have it. When I was uh, ice speed skating, that's exactly what we did. We had to develop starts, we develop all that lap speed, we had to develop endurance, uh, pain tall, all that different stuff. So in a biological standpoint, whatever is limiting for growth right now, whether it's the nervous system, whether it's, I mean, tendons and ligaments, the old guys used to talk about that all the time, talking about, you know, how that that could become a limiting factor and not, you know, how you should, you know, train train the sinews to go way back in the day uh, with the funny ass language that, yeah, I think there's probably something to it. And I think if you probably look at successful folks, they do a combination. Um, I mean, I don't know that Dorian ever did a lot of pump work, but he did enough volume. You know, dog crap is very low volume. And again, not everyone is cut out to uh to do that constantly i mean it works but it burns a lot of people out and there is something to be said for doing you know some lower intensity higher volume stuff from time to time if just to get a break as to give different different adaptations now one thing i'm curious longevity, longevity is huge it's the sustainability of training if you want to do long term because you know oh, yeah. i think about i think of dorian's training what built him also destroyed him in the end well, that's also yeah. the same. I mean, a lot yeah, of the IT guys have gone the same route. Yes. I mean, and big picture stuff, I mean, A, at that level, you're going to get, there's just the nature of high level sport. But I think in the big picture, he had a couple of minor injuries. And I mean, he's in his 60s now and he's still doing pretty well compared to where I think a lot of people are that went. And, and I think he said that in hindsight, he wishes he deloaded more frequently. I believe I heard that somewhere that he does wish that he had taken a little bit more, got a little bit more recovery. Um, 
because I don't even know exactly how he deloaded if it was volume or intensity. But and that is, you know, and that is an issue, right? Going back to some of the stuff with like adding volume and adding sets and some of these progressions. There is no doubt in my mind that when people get very, very, very strong, you run into other considerations. And I do think, and again, this is where I know some of the stuff with, you know, volume escalation, which I don't particularly agree with. And most people, even when that was the thing, were like, yeah, not, you know, pretty much everybody but Mike was like, no, we don't do that. Um, even like Greg Knuckles, lots of people, even Eric Helms, but Mike wrote this article for the journal, Strength and Conditioning Journal, where he put that stupid go from 10 sets to 20 and back off again. And I'm like, why? You're either doing suboptimal volumes or excessive volumes. I'm like, just pick optimal volumes and stay there for fuck's sake. Just quit messing with it. And Eric Helms and a couple people wrote an article and basically tore it to pieces and said, we recommend picking volumes based on either the research or, you know, historical trends and simply staying there until you get the adaptation and adding weight. And I'm like, wow, that sounds extremely familiar. But where I do think you get into some of that, and I know that this is where Mike is coming from, because I know his ex-coach, who does do volume escalation, and the volumes escalate as the doses escalate, and that's where that comes from. Because I do, in as much as I know much about drugs, which is not, is training is different by needs. It, well, it doesn't, it, it can be different, rather, in the sense of, you don't have to work as at high as high of an intensity as a natural might. You don't have to focus quite as much on tension. Like you do the work and kind of let the drugs do the rest. Because I mean, you because I mean, yeah, you look at some of these guys. I mean, Jesus Christ, some of these big top pros. You know, they've got eight plates aside on the hack squat. Like you run out of weight. Like there's only so much you can put on the bar, and, and at some point, you may not be able to use. You know. But then again, and this is again uh, something that I don't know why this still exists in the fitness industry. The idea that progressive overload means adding something every week. Because it doesn't. At any fundamental level, any basic exercise sports science program, that's not what progressive overload is. You do not have to add anything week to week to week. You don't have to do more sets. You don't have to do more reps. You don't have to add weight every week. I think it's correct with the psychological which for the same reason that people look in the mirror after every session that they've been to the gym well, expecting to see more growth. So yeah, therefore they need to change. I, I guess, but I mean, I still see people advocating this. So like that was yeah. when I did the debate with Mike and I was like adding volume. He's like, well, you can't add weight every week. Well, motherfucker, who said you should or can or... And, and the, you know the thing is, about Mike's program, you know, we have the historical knowledge about programs and do you remember that big Beyond Belief pro uh, oh, yeah. product? That was I love that That's book. fucking Mike's program. He fucking copied it, oh, plagiarized really? it, and put a different name on it. Nice. I can send you a copy. It's exactly the fucking same program. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, oh, that was that was some all-time craziness. I mean, it had some gems. I mean, it had some good ideas in there, but it was there was some super Looney Tunes stuff in there um, with the different the different levers and, and you know intuitive training and plats and all that crazy stuff. Um, yeah, that was, that thing was funny, but yeah, this idea, cause someone told me, you know, there's that early RP, uh, not an app. It was just basically a spreadsheet and like, where you were supposed to, you know, where you, you, you used soreness and the pump as an indicator of the workout. People were like, yeah, we did this. And like you said, the volumes went up exponentially every week. You started at three and it ended up at 35 by the end Ridiculous. of it. Like, this is asinine. Right. A failure. Well, of course. Um, <laughs> But it's like, no, you, you find, you know, a sweet spot volume and you wait for the adaptation to occur. And then you do, then you make a change when you're ready for it. And how often that occurs will depend on how advanced you are, right? I mean, beginners can add weight workout to workout. That's mostly neurological, it's not growing that fast. Intermediates might be every three or four weeks. It's you'll add it when you're ready. At the advanced level, shit. It may be eight to 10 weeks. And this is another thing with, with some of the research, right? So there's been a couple of studies, short-term, like eight weeks. One compared adding weight to, they, they had like four different workouts. It was like straight sets and 
there was something else and and they just had them pick and do different workouts and then brad supposedly did a paper i'm waiting to see, where he's like rather than adding weight we added reps and i want to see the raw data because it wasn't in the original paper and i'm like fine i'm not going to debate this and again i think that's one of those that he's like yep prove that Lyle's wrong about adding weight to the bar. Because his book, Max Muscle, it mentions frequency, intensity, reps and reserve, volumes. Nowhere does it say you need to add weight to the bar. Not a word. You've got to be kidding me. Regardless, over the short term, eight weeks, absolutely, you may not need to add weight to the bar if you're advanced. Absolutely not. It may remain a training load. And adding reps up to a point can be a stimulus. Even Dante, when you talked about beating the, the logbook, as I recall, it was one or the other. You either tried to add weight if you could, or you tried to do at least one more rep. And he had some really interesting ideas about exercise variation and some, sort of some tricks is the wrong word, but the way he built the system in, it, it allowed for some interesting things to happen. But it's like, even when people ask me that, like, why can't you just add reps? I'm like, well, two reasons. One, some people will just shit at adding reps. Depends on the person. Uh, some people can, some people can do it. I go, number, well, there's three reasons. Number two, each rep is worth about two to three percent. And I ask them, okay, can you add two to three percent to the bar? Then you can't add a rep. I go, but number three, when the fuck does it stop? All right, you're doing 100 kilos by 10, 12, 14. 20, 72, like at what point have you reached a point of it? Like how long can you keep adding reps? But in the short term, absolutely, right? Let's say you've picked a weight. It's whatever. It's a 10 RM, your 10 rep max. Well, you could add weight and stay in that rep range. You add a rep and a rep and a rep every week or every other workout or whatever. Well, that's still a training load over the short term, but eventually it's going to stop becoming a training load. So yeah, over eight weeks, absolutely that can work. Because that, assuming you're not a beginner, that same absolute weight on the bar will absolutely still be a mechanical, that will be a tension up, that will be a tension, a sufficient training load. And at some point it will, and what, I, what my gut says, um, because like I said, the, the original paper that, that Brad put out didn't have the data of how many reps got added. Apparently they're saving that for a second publication that I don't think has come out. I want to see how many reps got added. Because if they started with a 10 RM and only got to like 13, well, then you're still at, you know, three reps in reserve. You're still well within a training stimulus. And over eight weeks, yeah, I would have no argument with that. Now show me over a year. Show me that you can just keep doing that without adding weight to the bar. So yeah, in the short term, like I said, advanced level, I mean, Jesus, again, look at other sports. This is always a funny thing with the HIT thing. Like, ah, oh, you should be able to progress every week. Like, what sport does that? What sport expects a 100-meter sprinter to run 2% faster next week and 2% faster? No, you train for a year. Train for 12 weeks to maybe get a 1% increase. Same thing I think you said like a record. Uh, the record in speed skating was uh, missed recently by 0.5 thousandths of a second. So it yeah, shows, was... like, the that they're dealing with. Oh, yeah. Well, there was, I think what I was, there was something, uh, Chris Hoy, who's a UK track cyclist, went to set the uh, kilometer world record at this high altitude velodrome in, in La Paz, Bolivia, and he missed it by five thousandths of a second. He missed it by, you know, uh, an eyelash. But this idea that like, yeah, you should, you know, be able to progress workout to workout to workout forever is asinine. It doesn't, that load, that, you know, the speed a cyclist is riding at, the speed a runner is running at, will be a stimulus until it's not. Until all those adaptations catch up and they get the next level and suddenly, you know, what was this level of training is now that level of training. Well, now you go a little bit faster. It's the same thing in the weight room. I think you make yeah, it. And after after doing people. this for 30 years, it really does become a game of millimeters because oh, yeah. most of the time you're just trying to maintain what you have and any extra reps or a quarter kilo on the bar is a win in a 12-week oh, yeah. block. Well, and, and this is, I think this is the other thing, and this might be a good place to, to start wrapping up, because I know you don't have all day, is 
people have really gotten, I mean, have a, such a huge misconception of A, how quickly they can progress or should be progressing, and B, how long they can progress. And I think this is, a run, again, it's a big problem with the industry is because people have, have come into my group and they're like, I've been training for a while. I'm not, I can't add five pounds, two and a half kilos to the bar every week anymore. What am I doing wrong? I'm like, are you out of your mind? Like, that would be, <laughs> right? Two and, geez, that, that would be 10 kilos a month. That would be 120 kilos a year to the bar if you were still able to do that. You would be at the absolute upper limit of what anybody has ever lifted in four or five years. That is not, because they hear, oh, you know, starting strength and five by five and you're adding five pounds a week. Yeah, as a beginner. And then it's maybe two and a half kilos every two weeks. And then it's two and a half kilos a month. And then, I mean, I've told, I train, you know, an elite power lifter and, oh my God, we're at the eight year mark. She grinds for 13 weeks to get two and a half kilos on her best lift to get, you know, what is that? Um, you know, to get two and a half percent, it takes 13 weeks to get there. Sometimes it doesn't even happen there. You are grinding for such tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. Track sprinters are training a year to get six hundredths of an improvement. I mean, and then naturals forget, like assuming you're training well, like if someone came to me tomorrow as a complete beginner, said, I put, I put myself in your hands to train me. I would tell them in four years, that's it. After I've trained you properly for four years, you're done. You are, or if you're not done, you're done enough because you'll make, you know, you'll make. 10 kilos the first year, maybe a little bit more if you're lucky. You make five kilos the second year, muscle gain. You make two and a half kilos the third year. I might get a few more out of you in the final year with specialization cycles. And that's it. I mean, you look at these, these, these pro-natural bodybuilders and they're like, yeah, I trained a year. I grounded myself into the dirt for half a kilo to be half a kilo bigger on stage. Dude, find a better hobby. The only solution at the four-year mark is drugs. be more, more multifaceted and more interesting and in other things, you know? Yeah, yeah like at that point, just move it like, I mean, I get it as an elite competitor, but God, what a waste of time. What an absolute waste of time. At that point, you know, at the four-year mark of productive training, that's about all the gains you're going to get. Other, I mean, you can scrape and just murder yourself for the absolute, you know, so this guy in the UK that I consult with, you know, he's got a fantastic physique. He's going to have spent a year to probably gain, you know, a couple kilos. Now, if you're talking about adding, you know, whatever, a quarter kilo to his arms, that's going to be visually different. And he's at the point where he needs that extra little bit of symmetry and balance. But for the average person, good God almighty, go find something more enjoyable to do with your life than, than being in the gym or go on anabolics. Like that's just that, which is fine, but I realize that that's what needs to happen. My favorite stories, and we can wrap up. This bodybuilder in Salt Lake City. When I was skating, I hung out at the gym, and um, and I was and I just talked to him, and we were talking about this, and he was obviously on drugs. And I, don't, I don't give a shit, and I was like, I'm just curious. Like, when did you decide to make that that choice? He goes, Well, I was a top natural. I was maybe 195 in contest shape, which is uh, 80, about 90 kilos. Yeah, about there. Um, and then he's like, and that's, <laughs> but the way he phrased it was great. He said, I no longer wanted to be natural. I wanted to be supernatural. And I'm like, that's the best answer I've ever heard. He just like, he just realized that he wasn't going to get past that point. I mean, whatever he was, you know, a good 100 kilo. 105 kilo competitor, but he's like, yeah, I, I knew I'd gotten as far as I could get and I wanted to be supernatural. And I'm like, cool. Um, you know, I got, I got no problem with that, but yeah. So that's people think, yep. Yeah. And, and of course the industry promotes that and they're like, oh yeah. I mean, going back to the whole online fitness thing and where we started every time one of these guys who's been, you know, a top guy for years, top pro bodybuilder, which has its own issue that like, look, these are the guys that by definition got great genetics. I'm not saying they didn't put in the work, 
but they may not necessarily be indicative of what works for everybody. They're like, yeah, you know, we're doing high frequency training and it's really working well for me. And I'm like, give me a break. You haven't gained half a kilo in five years of muscle. Do not say this is working really well for you to sell your new ebook because that's just a bold faced lie, especially when next month you're going to be doing something different. But yeah, it's like, yeah, these guys, whatever, you've hit your limits, that's great. Um, I think the other thing, also, just finally, finally, and I keep saying that, there's always been a real disconnect in the average natural thinking in terms of how big they think they are. And it's worse now because you've got the fake naturals on TikTok and Instagram, all these, the trend brothers that are obviously using and claiming they're not. Because you've got these guys that are like, you know, I'm 185, I'm, I'm 85 kilos in shape. I'm not that big. I go, you cannot compare yourself to the monsters. I go, compared to the average person, you are gigantic. But when you're looking at pictures of guys, I mean, good Lord, Arnold, depending on who you talk to, competed between 100 and 110 kilos. I've seen different numbers thrown around. It was in that range. He was six foot one. He was big. My opinion, he had mediocre legs for, for the time, even for the time, because he was so tall. And he wasn't as conditioned as guys are now. You, you, you get him as ripped and as dry as guys are now, he would be easily five kilos lighter than he was in that era. Right? And he's considered big. Dorian, well, Lou Ferrigno was like 135 kilos, but he was like six foot ten. Like the dude was a giant. Dorian competed at what? At 281 pounds? He was like 135 kilos, something in that range. I I fly one back flying back once from the Arnold Classic. Uh, Ronnie Coleman was on the plane. You cannot even comprehend how big he is until you see him in person. He was taking up two entire airplane seats in first class and still didn't have, like, you, you see pictures and go, yeah, he's big. You can't even fathom it. And guys now are 150 kilos in shape. I mean, in context. Five foot seven. Say again? At five foot seven, look at Nick Walker. Yeah, you know. I mean, just like you see these, they're not even human anymore. They look like the Belgian blue cattle, the myostatin null cattle. But so you've got these natural and it's completely skewed their idea. And they're like, well, I'm only 85 kilos lean. I should be bigger. I should be stronger. I, I mean, even, you know, this isn't meant to be, this sounds like criticism and it's not. And they're like, oh yeah, we've got the first two raw natural thousand pound squats, 440 some odd kilo squats. I'm like, yeah, make no mistake. Those are staggering lifts. Those guys weigh 200 kilos, right? Jesus, I look, and he doesn't look at Jesus Olivares. He's like, I looked it up. He's like 225 kilos body weight. I'm like, make no mistake. And Ray Williams is gigantic. He's similar. He's like 400 pounds, like 190 kilos. I'm like, yeah, look, you cannot look at those thousand pound squats and expect your 85 kilo butt to be anywhere close to that. If you're doing, you know, 315, if you're doing 405 by eight, if you know, if you're doing 100, what's that? That's 405, 180 kilos for eight. You're stronger than most people, but you cannot look at those monsters, those freaks of nature, and I mean that in a good way, without just completely thinking you're nothing, like compared to the, so yeah, you've got all these things who are like, ah, oh, I should still be growing after four years. No, sorry, probably not, and nothing, volume, not length and partials, not any of this other stuff is not going to get you growing. The only thing that will is special sports supplements, and those were great so anyway. and on that note i'd really like to thank you for your time lyle because you've been extremely Absolutely. gracious today Absolutely. we hit a three hour mark it's uh been sensational right. a dream a dream for me actually because i've been waiting to talk to you for over 30 years you know the conversation's cool. in my head yeah no i'm glad we got um, to and i'd love to if you want to have me on again later we can talk about something else yeah with sumi would be great as well oh yeah um, absolutely yeah, because uh, she's got a lot of interesting ideas. And, of course, she's had that firsthand experience from you for, for years. Yep. So it would be great. But I um, just want to thank you again for being the voice of reason, clarity, and integrity right. in the industry. You're keeping it all. And I uh, hope we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks very much again.
All right, Sean. Cheers, Lyle. Bye. Bye.